so friends uh, we are going to record all the theory chapters of sfm uh, the only disclaimer or the kind of thing which i want to say is uh, whatever uh, whatever i am covering in these chapters will give you some overview of every topic which is being discussed it will give you certain critical points which can be taken into consideration for writing in exams but i would strongly suggest you to go through these 66 pages in detail and be better prepared with all the questions because you will have to see how are you going to answer them from an exam point of view so there are 14 chapters there are 66 uh, pages i would want you to go through in detail in all these 66 pages some of the information you may have to buy hard some of the information you'll have to understand logically so these videos are just a tool to understand things they are not going to be a substitute for a preparation which is to be done at your end you may have to do a little bit of detailed preparation at your end and be done with these 66 pages these 66 pages can help you in scoring some 15 or 16 marks out of the 20 marks of theory which is there in SFM hi friends I'm basically doing this recording for your SFM theory areas so we'll start today with one chapter and I'll gradually try to record all the chapters and provide you <coughs> as far as new syllabus is concerned you'd be aware that every question which gets tested in exam a 20 mark question will have a subset of a theory being asked it could be a four mark question it could be a six mark question it can be an eight mark question and most of the times in exam you would be forced to answer theory for at least 20 marks this is what I had uh, in fact indicated in the class and theory is something which can never be missed out by the students now as far as theory is concerned what we have done is we have categorized the questions as category A, B and C this is only kind of a priority for preparation there are 39 category A questions there are 58 category B questions and there are 31 category C questions now this categorization will help you in prioritizing which questions are important and which questions are relatively less important does this mean that I can miss out on these questions or can I do a different kind of a preparation I don't think so everything becomes extremely important uh, uh, but uh, give maybe if you can revise category A questions five times category B question can be revised three times category C question can be revised maybe one or two times and uh, from an exam point of view we have seen that uh, predominant set of questions have come from category A and B but that doesn't mean none has repeated from category C we have seen questions even coming from category C now uh, in this also if you see certain chapters are pure theory based chapters certain chapters are combination of practical problems and theory so in that this is pure theory based chapter uh, chapter 1 <coughs> chapter 2 has a small component of problem solving but predominantly it's again a theory based predominantly theory this is predominantly problem solving predominant theory problem solving problem solving problem solving uh, this is a combination of a theory and problem solving predominantly problem solving problem solving problem solving and this is predominantly theory based area so those chapters which are predominantly theory based areas you will have to be extremely clear on them and there's a high probability of questions coming from them uh, there can be questions from other areas also but let's take this chapter 1 2 3 chapter 6 and chapter 14 I see a high probability of a direct theory questions coming from them because problems cannot be tested uh, there are no problems there so every chapter has its own weightage in exam so somewhere a theory question may get tested now coming to the first chapter which is financial policy and corporate strategy now see what I am going to do is I'm not going to try to read out this entire content I'll try to focus on certain essential points which are critical uh, now a uh, corporate strategy is basically see anything which uh, anybody does an organization does a strategy plays a critical part uh, I need to have a clear strategy as to what I want to achieve you could uh, learn about the importance of strategy in strategic management at inter level you would have learnt about it so strategy is basically something which gives me a long term direction as to what I want to achieve and without having a strategy in place 
it's very difficult for me to move ahead so business basically uh, they say what are the three essential elements of a business one of the essential element is there should be a clear and realistic strategy uh, so if you have a clear and a realistic strategy it gives you what you want to achieve and with clear and realistic strategy being in place for example i am working today uh, let's assume i have a clear and realistic strategy saying that i want to retire at this age that's my strategy or that's my plan in place which i have put in and if that is a plan which i have put in i need to bring in the financial resources for me to achieve it and there should be a right management so at my end i am the only person who is going to take care of it but from an organization point of view these are the three essential elements which are needed that is strategy plus finance plus management anything which an organization does everything has to root through finance uh, you can do production planning you can do manpower planning you can do sales planning you can do uh, research and development everything finally has to uh, uh, has to be described in terms of money has to be described in terms of finance so business needs to have the following three essential elements one there should be a clear strategy i need to have financial resources which can help me to make it through them and there should be a right management team which can help this happen so if you have a strategy plus finance plus management that can help an organization to survive and that is the root that is the basic thing which is needed in an organization <coughs> now write short note on strategy i have already talked about what is a strategy strategy is something which gives a long term direction it uh, gives you what you want to achieve over a longer period of time there can be a mission and vision of an organization from the mission and vision of an organization i can bring in a strategy strategy can be something like a corporate level strategy it can be something like a functional level strategy it can be something like a business level strategy we'll learn this in some time so strategy is basically something which will give a long term direction and <clears throat> it will help an organization to achieve something called as a competitive advantage and final expectation is i'll have to meet the stakeholders aspirations and expectation now a stakeholder in an organization is not only a shareholder of the company a stakeholder can include a lot of people so stakeholder for example can be a customer a customer would need a good quality product at an affordable price an employee an employee would want a good working atmosphere good uh, growth in his career good growth in his remuneration a supplier would want us to make a prompt payment to him a lender a lender is also a stakeholder lenders would want that we make prompt payment of principal and interest government is also a stakeholder they would want us to pay taxes on time society is a stakeholder society would want us to do csr activities so <coughs> this is an important question what are the key decisions falling within the scope of financial strategy at inter level you would have learnt about uh, something called as what a cfo does now just give me a minute now we would have learnt about uh, what a cfo does so from a cfo point of view it used to be like this this is company this is financial markets cfo is a person who is in between he what he used to do is he raises money from this place and invest in them so a cfo's role is to raise money from the financial markets so you raise money from the financial markets in the form of debentures in the form of shares after raising money you invest that money you will invest that money in real assets so a primary role of a cfo is to convert a financial asset like a equity share or a debenture into a real asset like a land building plant and machinery so the two critical things which he does is investment decision and financing decision after doing this at the end of the year he has to now do a financial analysis and decide what kind of dividend he can pay back so 
this is what predominantly a CFO does one is financing decision investment decision and dividend decision financing decision is what kind of money I raise I can raise money in the form of shares uh, debentures preference shares term loans I will invest the money in certain capital projects when I'm investing I'll have to take care of risk return and trade-off projects which carry high risk will give high returns projects which carry low risk will give low returns and somewhere i'll have to try to balance them dividend decision is what proportion of earnings i can distribute back to the shareholders it'll also depend on my sustainable growth rate which you will see in some time and portfolio decisions these are decisions which is basically trying to assess the aggregate performance of the entire corporation rather than the individual performance of the this is also a separate area which have here which we have in uh, final level then what is the interface between a financial policy and strategic management now one important point is anything which an organization does the one part of my analysis will focus on whether I have this or not whether there is adequate money available or not for an activity to be done and if an activity is going to be done what is it going to finally reflect in earning this so I check whether I have adequate money or not and I also check whether I will be in a position to earn the money and give it back so whatever activity is being done there is an expectation that you should earn adequate money and you should return that money so uh, what <coughs> every activity which an organization does has to somewhere focus on uh, finance has to somewhere focus on availability of money so uh, the starting point of an organization is money and the ending point of an organization is also money and some additions like sources of finance capital structure investment decision dividend decision are all an important aspects of strategic plan not only you fix uh, not only you're bothered about mobilization of funds you're also bothered about investments and fund allocation decisions basically it's in, in fact whatever you have covered in question 3 is basically covered here you first bother about the financing side of it you bother about the investment side of it you bother about the dividend side of it and all of this have a close interface with the strategic management side so there is a close interface between a financial policy and a strategic management because of your decisions like investment decisions financing decisions dividend decisions will affect the availability of money and if that affects the availability of money it will also affect the ability of an organizations to take up uh, to give effect to other strategies which are there so there is a financial policy cannot be worked out in isolation of other functional policy and it has a closer link now this is what I had talked about some time back on different types of strategy there's a corporate level strategy it's like this uh, basically it goes like this you have corporate then you have business then you have functional corporate can be ITC ITC has different business segments uh, it has a paper segment it has a uh, retail segment it also has a <coughs> tobacco segment it also has a hospitality segment so those will be a strategy for every business it has and in the business there are certain functions which are there the functions can be production function sales function so you can prepare a strategy for every function so the starting point is a corporate strategy which will basically tell you the top level strategy of the company this is basically also a top level strategy so it will basically tell what kind of businesses an organization should compete and also understand the impact of this on the portfolio decisions then a business level strategy is basically for the individual businesses like the paper business or the FMCG business or the hosp hospitality business or the tobacco business which will be planned independently for every business organizations and they are something like a profit center what is a profit center is, is something which is responsible for revenues as well as cost so the small units will have uh, <coughs> their strategy and their strategy will emanate from the corporate level strategy whatever is the corporate level strategy something from that is what is going to translate into a business unit level strategy 
and functional level strategies for the various functional businesses which is I said R&D operations manufacturing marketing finance human resource so all of this also needs a strategy once these strategies are executed effectively your business level strategy will be executed and if business level strategy is executed effectively your corporate level strategy can be taken care of so somewhere there is a close link between a corporate level strategy a business level strategy and a functional level strategy now then what is financial planning and what are the components of financial planning now see financial planning is basically planning for money basic thing is you need to do something called as a planning for money now they say it's a backbone of business planning as well as corporate planning and it'll also define what is a feasible area of operation I'll give you a classic example of a financial planning now I have decided that I want to go on a trip now the trip is going to cost me two lakh fifty thousand I did all set of planning uh, that is where I will stay how will I go uh, from where do I take the flight uh, where where are the hotels I'm going to stay I've done all of that but I did not do the financial planning angle of it and then I get to know later that I do not have two lakh fifty thousand with me and I'll not be in a position to go on this trip the entire other planning will go for a toss if you do not have financial if you do not have money power so it will first define what is the feasible area of operation and unfortunately the trip of 250000 is not a feasible activity for me that is not becoming a feasible activity for me so and if i have to make it feasible i should have earlier gone for a financial planning so financial planning is a systematic approach which helps you in making maximum usage of your existing financial resources by using financial tools and financial goals so financial planning is basically equal to three things financial resources financial tools and financial goals these are the three components of your financial planning what can make an organization financially sustainable now when you see this question you think about what can make an individual financially sustainable rather than even thinking about an organization now I should have more than one way of source of income that is also at my personal end if there is a more than one source of income it can help me making financially sustainable what is financially sustainable is ability of mine to meet my expenses have more than one way of generating income have a good public image be clear about values have financial autonomy if I have a good public image if people are knowing well about me there's a possibility for me to get easy loans whenever there's a no so Tata's Tata's have a very good public image and if they go for a bank for a loan they easily get it the bank loans which they are going to get the rate of interest at which they get there's always a different rate at which Tata's will get a loan and a different rate at which Dinesh Jain can get a loan so you will have to be having a very good public image do something for the society have clear values have financial autonomy and all of this can help you making a financially sustainable organization now comes what is sustainable growth rate you could have learnt this earlier also growth rate is equal to IRR slash ROE into retention ratio this is basically the growth rate which can be sustained over a long period I cannot keep growing every year at the rate of 40 percent because if I keep growing at the rate of 40 percent every year I also need financial power because when revenues grow your working capital requirements go up your fixed assets go up if these two go up you also need equity to go up debt to go up and if you are not able to bring this the debt will keep piling up and finally you will see that you are not in a position to pay off the debt and you will get into something called as a stressed asset scenario so a sustainable growth rate is a maximum growth rate 
in sales that can be achieved given the firm's profitability, asset utilization, desired dividend payout and debt ratios. There's a desired debt ratio. If you are trying to take more and more debt and grow at some point of time, you will find it difficult to service the debt which has come in. Uh, how much can a firm grow without borrowing more money? Uh, it has also explained without borrowing more money. Uh, you can also say an organization can borrow some money because there's something called as a debt ratio. Debt ratio basically indicates debt by debt plus equity. Debt ratio is debt by debt plus equity. This is the formula. Debt ratio is equal to debt by debt plus equity. So when I use this formula for debt ratio, what is going to happen is Okay, uh, when I use this formula, my equity will go up uh, in a practical world with every year because you make profits. So last year, the denominator was 1000. Now it is 400 debt. Next year, this 400, let it remain same. This will be 400. Equity could have gone up to 500. Uh, equity could have gone up to 700. So earlier it was 40%. Now this ratio will slightly come down. So what they say is if equity goes up, you can proportionately also borrow money. So there can be some borrowing which can also happen. And this is the formula I was saying. ROE into 1 minus dividend payout ratio. Uh, they want you to maintain a target capital structure, target dividend payout ratio and increase sales. But the most important point is no need to grow at a very, very strong rate very healthy rate because what will happen is if you keep growing at a very high rate you will find it difficult to service debt so you should be comfortable in servicing debt and also keep growing so that rate is called as a sustainable growth rate with this chapter one is over <coughs> hi friends uh, and now we'll start with uh, chapter two which is on risk management. Let's first understand what does the term risk mean. Risk is basically nothing but what can go wrong for an organization. So risk is equal to WCGW basically means what can go wrong. Now from an organization point of view risk management is extremely critical because if I'm not focusing on risk management there is a possibility that I may go out of business and there are multiple types of risks which an organization can face there's something called as a strategic risk which is going to impact the competitive position of the company it can uh, it is basically something which is going to impact the company's uh, strategy which becomes less effective it is not able to achieve its goal it can be a compliance risk compliance risk is basically arises when there is non-compliance with the rules and regulations which are there for example income tax act has its own set of rules and regulations GST has its own set of rules and regulations and if an organization is not abiding by them then there are penalties which are levied and sometimes the penalties can be so huge that it can impact the company in a it can impact the company in a significant manner i also have something called as an operational risk so i have one strategic risk i have compliance risk i have operational risk i also have financial risk Strategic is something which is going to impact my, uh, it is going to impact my strategy. It is basically going to make my strategy less effective. It can arise and classic example of a strategic risk which arose. Moment Geo entered, a new competitor, Reliance Geo entered, it has impacted the strategies of a lot of players. Airtel strategy had to undergo a change. Vodafone idea had to undergo a change. Some of the players went out of the business itself. Compliance risk, not able to meet the rules and regulations. Operational risk is basically something process driven or also known as internal risk. When an organization is not able to cope up with the day-to-day -day operational problems. 
and I also have something called as a financial risk which is uh, some changes in the financial conditions so let's look at here strategic risk this basically something which is going to impact and company strategy becomes less and it struggles to achieve its goal an example is new competitor entering the market compliance risk non-compliance with rules and regulations it can lead to penalties in the form of fine and imprisonment operational risk is also known as process driven risk or a people driven risk this is an internal risk which is not able to meet the day-to-day -day operational uh, problems and financial risk is your unexpected changes in financial conditions financial conditions can be prices exchange rate credit rating and internal rate <coughs> now we are going to focus extensively on financial risk so we first saw different risks now our focus shifts to financial risk now what are the different types of financial risk which are there there can be multiple types but what we focus is one is counterparty counter party risk this is one thing I'll focus on I'll also focus on interest rate risk we'll also focus on currency risk and political risk these are the four types of risks which will be focused on a financial risk part of you we have a counterparty risk interest rate risk currency risk and political risk what is counterparty risk is this is also known as something called as a default risk or a credit risk what happens is I sell my goods to an external customer now when I've already sold the goods I would expect the counterparty to make the payment to me but if this guy is not honoring my obligations then I will have a counterparty risk and that's going to impact my performance so non honoring of obligations by the counterparty or repayment of borrowings etc now how can I avoid a counterparty risk if you see I can avoid a counterparty risk uh, for example when I'm selling my goods there's something called as a letter of credit if I take an LC facility then that will ensure that counterparty risk is taken care of when I'm giving some loans I also take some securities from the people so that will ensure that counterparty risk is minimized to some extent okay what is political risk is this is something which is faced by only overseas investors now sometimes what happens is uh, I have invested in India I am an overseas investor and uh, now in India what has happened is they have put in certain conditions the government of India has put in certain conditions which is going to restrict the remittance from uh, so I'm an US I'm an US citizen I have invested in India market and what happened is this Indian company is not able to give back the money which has been invested or is not able to provide any returns that's because there is some rationing of remittance or restriction on borrowings all this is going to impact myself the third part is interest rate risk now interest rate risk is this risk is basically a uh, variation in the cash flow arising due to changes in interest rates this is going to significantly impact the banking companies because their assets as well as liabilities are mostly interest sensitive whereas from a corporate point of view they'll be really bothered about if interest rates move up currently if you see the scenario is RBI has been gradually reducing the interest rates but if you move into an inflationary kind of a condition RBI will keep increasing the interest rates and if, if interest rates are continuously increasing that's going to impact an organization's cash flow and currency risk is basically which affects the organization dealing with foreign exchange and your cash flows will vary with the exchange rates now in in this cha in this subject itself we'll learn about how do we cover currency risk in forex chapter there are a lot of techniques which are involved there's currency invoicing there's forward contract there is netting there's a futures contract there is an option so all those techniques will help you in covering the currency risk side of it now the financial risk they say can be viewed from different perspectives now what is different perspective there's a stakeholder so there is a stakeholder point of view I can look at I can also look at from a company point of view I can also look at from a government point of view so I have a stakeholder point of view I have a company point of view I have a government point of view so these are the uh, so we have stakeholder government company 
now there are multiple stakeholders in a company which i had explained when i did the earlier chapter also but the major stakeholders are basically equity guys and debenture investors and they will look at the existing gearing of the company financial gearing ratio of debt because if there is a huge debt in a company what will happen is the equity guys may not earn their returns they are kind of a residual the in the event of winding up uh, they will be least prioritized so having too much of a debt in a company will be will be like a difficult thing for an equity shareholder because that will impact their ability to earn dividends and get repayment of the investment or get return of capital which has been invested even the lender who gives loans to they will also be bother about the existing gearing because if the gearing is very high there's a high likelihood of default of principal and interest from a company point of view also we see the same thing the basic thing is uh, if you borrow excessively or you lend money to someone who defaults so there's two ways say one is if i borrow excessively or lend to someone who defaults basically the counterparty risk then i can be forced to go into liquidation from a comp uh, from a government point of view if there is a failure of any big bank or there is a downgrading of uh, any financial institution that can lead to a distrust among the society at large so there's the, uh, for example if you see current scenario pmc bank in pmc bank what had happened is the depositors who had given the money they are not able to get back the money which has been invested there are a lot of restrictions which have been put in so off late when when somebody wants to create a fixed deposit now they are thinking whether this bank is extremely safe or not whether i can create a fd in this bank or not all because of the pmc bank uh, uh, the episode which has happened so from a government point of view they wouldn't want a failure of any big bank so there's a lot of distrust among the society in fact there are a lot of messages which keeps floating saying that my money is not safe even in a bank now that's because of this pmc issue which has happened and government wouldn't want so the financial risk can be viewed from a company's point of view which is if they lend money to anybody who defaults such as a counterparty risk or if they excessively borrow there's a possibility of them going into liquidation stakeholder would not be wanting the company to have a very high gearing and government wouldn't want a big financial institution to fail now in all this now we are going to learn about something called as value at risk there's a problem solving area also this but this is uh, just from a theory point of view what is value at risk and explain its features and application now value at risk is basically trying to answer two basic questions what is the worst case scenario and what will be the loss for the company so i'll assume that the worst thing is going to happen and once the worst thing happens i will take into consideration what is the possible loss for the company now how this var is calculated normally is var is equal to it depends on one what is the confidence level you want 95% confidence or in 99% confidence and these confidence levels will have a z value associated with it or a z score associated with it so you will try to get what is the z score for a 95% confidence level or for a 99% confidence level and my var will be equal to this score into the standard deviation which will be calculated so i'll take this var multiply with the standard deviation which is there now for example a 95% confidence level will have a value of 1.65 a 99% confidence level will have a value of 2.33 so my var is basically dependent on z score and the standard deviation which is there so var is equal to z score into standard deviation var can be calculated for a day for a week for a month and so on so there are different components which go on but the important thing is what is the confidence level you want and what is the standard deviation what is the time horizon so this is how we calculate var now why does an organization calculate var there are multiple reasons but the important thing is it will help me in identifying maximum possible loss and somewhere i will be prepared for the worst thing which can happen second it can also help me in fixing certain limits 
for my treasury operations treasury operations is basically a front office which deals with trading of it, it can deal with trading in stock markets trading in uh, currency markets so when they do deal when they are doing this trading i would like to fix a limit so that my losses do not increase and also it can be helped for asset and liability management so maximum possible loss fix limits for individuals decide the trading strategies and a benchmark for performance measurement now what are the various hints indicating counterparty risk and how to manage the same i've already talked about what is a counterparty risk a counterparty risk is inability of my customer to pay off the money uh, pay off the uh, <coughs> pay off for the goods and services or if i've given a loan to someone he is not paying me so what can indicate that a counterparty risk is going to happen now a counterparty risk can arise if there is a weakening of performance of the other company so if i am going to sell goods to another company i would like to look at how is their operating performance how is the revenues growing how is the sales growing are they taking lot of loans if that happens it can be an issue can there be any regulatory restrictions or if they are not able to get the necessary resources or necessary approvals necessary resources regulatory restrictions let down or if they have become insolvent insolvent is gone if they have become insolvent then things become very bad now how do i manage this counterparty risk i should try to carry out a due diligence a due diligence is extremely critical if i carry out a due diligence before entering into a transaction that will give me a lot of confidence with the company so i will try to carry a due diligence i would also like to fix up some limits which are there so if limits are not there then what will happen is you will end up over committing to a single entity or a two connected entities so and try to get this performance guarantee or insurance i was talking about a letter of credit if i have a letter of credit in place that can take care of this risk which is there because a letter of credit will come into picture if the customer is not paying the customer's bank is going to pay for it now how to assess political risk so we have talked about counterparty risk uh, what are the hints which indicate it or how do you assess a counterparty risk and how do you manage it like counterparty risk i also have a political risk which is there now how do i assess the political risk which is there now there are different ways of assessing the political risk one way is to go by ranking so for every government there will be some ranking which will be published by business magazines you go by that you can also go by macro economic conditions which are there gdp growth inflation you take into those factors or how popular is the current government there so by referring political ranking you go with it or evaluating counterparty countries macro economic condition analyzing the popularity or taking some information from the embassies now how do i protect myself from political risk the only thing is make in india when i say make in india go for local sourcing of raw materials go for local financing do everything at a local level local sourcing local financing entering into joint ventures prior negotiations try to do things everything at a local level if that is done that is kind of taking care of it now how do i identify interest rate risk and currency risk interest rate risk is very simple what is interest rate risk is changes in the cash flows because of variation in the interest rate so in case there are any variation in the interest rates how do the variation in interest rates affect the cash flows now from india's point of view if i have to assess the interest rate risk the primary factor is going to be monetary policy monetary policy is rbi's policy that will kind of indicate second inflation can become a big factor in deciding uh, the change which is going to happen if there is if the country is continuously under inflation there's a possibility of increasing the interest rates if the growth is on the lower side the government may try to reduce the interest rates but if 
if the growth is there then they may not alter the interest rate so because lower interest rates can help in kicking in investments to happen so these are the factors i will assess for identifying the interest rate risk currency risk is basically the variation in the exchange rate which can happen there are lot of factors which impact exchange rate but primary factor which impact exchange rate is interest rate which you learn something called as purchasing power sorry interest rate parity theory and interest rate is primarily dependent on inflation and here you learn something called as purchasing power parity theory interest rate parity theory and purchasing power parity theory something which we touch upon international finance so this is one two major factors one is interest rate and inflation apart from this there can be some government actions which can be done there can be some rbi action which can be done there can be a change in government there can be some natural calamities all of this is going to impact so government action nominal interest rate which is your interest rate parity theory i was talking about inflation which is your purchasing power parity theory or natural calamities change of government so all of these factors are somewhere going to impact my currency risk now so what do you are we learning finally in this chapter in this chapter it's very simple i am trying to assess the different types of risks which are there so which we talked about there's a strategic risk there's a compliance risk there's an operational risk and there is a financial risk then we see the different types of financial risk wherein we have a counterparty risk we have a political risk we have a currency risk and an interest rate risk and then we try to assess every risk which is there and also we see how the financial risk is viewed from different people's point of view there is a government point of view there is a company point of view there is a stakeholder point of view and then my all balance question is one is on counter or one is how var is calculated then i focus on counterparty risk i focus on political risk i focus on interest rate risk and currency risk so with this i'll end the second chapter okay uh, let's now start with uh, chapter 3 recording we are going to focus on a chapter called as security analysis now this is an extremely important area from a theory oriented point of view because there is a lot of coverage on theory in this chapter now first we are going to discuss about what is security analysis so security analysis the two major components of security analysis are fundamental analysis and technical analysis these are the two major components as far as security analysis is concerned so what is security analysis is trying to analyze the risk and return profile of the various securities why do i analyze the risk and return profile of the various securities to estimate what can be the value of a company and helping me in making some decision on purchase so somewhere i'm going to try to find out whether it is the right time to buy a security or the right time to sell a security through security analysis so a systematic analysis of the risk return profiles to estimate a value for a company from the various price sensitive information or data so that he can make purchases when they are underpriced and you can sell them when they are overpriced and therefore earn a reasonable rate of return what we normally adopt is two techniques one is fundamental analysis and second is technical analysis these are the two techniques which are normally taken into consideration for doing security analysis now coming to fundamental analysis what is fundamental analysis is uh, it's technically also called as eic analysis which is economy industry and company analysis so there's a approach by which first you do economy level analysis that is try to find what can be the gdp growth of india uh, what are the growth rates in various sectors what is the inflation expectation what is the monsoon expectation what are the interest rates expectation so from economy then you move to industry level analysis and then from industry you try to move to a company level analysis so this is what is fundamental analysis is all about economy industry and company level analysis now uh you would have learnt this or you are going to learn this in the next chapter that is the value of a share is 
basically present value of future dividends expected by the shareholders which gives you the intrinsic value of a share now this intrinsic value of the share depends on the future dividends or the future cash flows and the future cash flows indirectly is depend on state of economy the state of the industry and the state of the company which is being analyzed so that is why fundamental analysis is also known as economic eic analysis economy industry and company analysis and objective of fundamental analysis is to find out what should be the right price for a company and you will try to find the intrinsic value and this is what you are technically going to do a share that is below the intrinsic value must be bought while a share which is quoting above the intrinsic value must be sold so the key variables which go here is economy wide factors industry wide factors and company specific factors in other words this is also called as eic analysis economic industry and company analysis that is what fundamental analysis is all about now my starting point in that is doing an economic analysis and they are saying what is economic analysis and what are the factors which are affecting now economic analysis is nothing but trying to forecast what can be the national income what can be the gdp growth which is going to be there in india so if i'm able to forecast gross domestic product or the national income or the gnp this will help me in understanding the state at which an economy is going currently if you look at in india the economy is going through a little bit of a downward phase the recent uh, numbers which have come for gdp growth that has been continuously coming down and now there is a worry whether there is going to be an economic slowdown which is going to happen in india if there is an economic slowdown what will happen is the industry performance will also get impacted and the company level performance will also get impacted so this is what i do in economic analysis i try to forecast the na national income so after forecasting the national income i will then try to go to the industry and then try to go to the company in particular there are various factors which can play a part in economic analysis uh, growth rates of the national income or the growth rates of the industrial sector or inflation in fact in india's context monsoon also plays a big part because monsoon has a significant impact on agriculture income or the rural income and if rural incomes are better rural spending can be better and that can lead to good growth in the different sectors so these are the factors which are going to impact my economic analysis one is growth rates of national income so the estimated growth rate of an economy would be a pointer as to what are the prospects going to be for the industrial sector then i can break this growth rate to industrial sector now you can look at it in two ways one is you see how the economy is going to grow and then try to find out how the sectors are going to grow the other approach is first trying to find out what are the various sectoral growth rates going to be and based on the sectoral growth rates i can try to find out the growth rate of the economy so it is kind of interlinked either you estimate this and find the industry growth rate but most of the times we first find the various industry growth rate club it together and try to get the economic growth rates inflation also plays a big part because if there is high inflation what will happen is the people uh, <clears throat> the if there is a continuous inflation which is going to happen industries like consumer product oriented industries people may defer their purchases or people will not be in a position to buy because uh, the value of the money has been continuously coming down and now they need to end up spending more so in that scenario you will have again an impact and monsoon monsoon is an extremely important factor from india's context because in monsoon what happens is it has a strong linkages they say forward and backward linkages both the side there are linkages so monsoon if there are good monsoons agriculture income agriculture sector will thrive economy will thrive and if there are good monsoons farmers will make better income if farmers make better income their purchasing power goes up so this is as far as your economic analysis is concerned so we started with what is security analysis we have gone to fundamental analysis in fundamental analysis i have economic industry and company analysis so next what are the various techniques which are used for economic analysis i will have to do a forecast of the economy so what are the techniques we normally use i will use something called as one anticipatory surveys second 
barometer r indicator approach this is the second uh, technique which we can use the third technique which i may end up using is economic model building approach so i have multiple ways of doing this these are the normally used ways anticipatory services i will try to get expert opinion on the growth rates which are there in various industries so i will get the expert opinion and based on the expert opinion i will try to understand how the growth rates are going to be uh, the only pitfall is the survey results may not materialize and sometimes what will happen is whatever is the survey end result it could be a consensus among the various people so survey is a one good approach but it may not finally indicate how the things are going to work then we have a barometer or an indicator approach now this barometer or an indicator approach was initially uh, forecasted or developed in 1920 so they developed this the logic was this is this barometer or an indicator approach can help us in finding out how the economy is going to perform in the future but this approach per se the barometer or indicator approach was not are uh, followed or had to be modified because it could not predict a great economic depression that had happened in 1930 so 1920 it was developed 1930s a great economic depression had happened and somewhere they could not predict this so there was some modification done this works with three things one is leading indicators i have this then i have coincidental indicators and i have lagging indicators these are the three parts to this approach there is a leading indicator there is a coincidental indicator and there is a lagging indicator leading indicator are those variables uh, which will move up or down and this will indicate that the economy is going to perform well or not they lead the economic activity some of the examples are investments done by the private uh, companies private investments or government investments are the profits which the organization is generating these will indicate whether the economy is going to perform well or not so an example can be investments coincidental indicators can move up can move down uh, there may not be a much linkage to the economic growth in these indicators economy may be growing but still it may not uh, it may come down or it may go up also so coincidental indicators are not exactly linked to the economy side an example of a coincidental indicator is number of employees in non agri sector now this can go up can come down uh, depending on uh, the economic variables but there is no major linkage per se which have uh, now next is lagging indicators this will be those indicators which are going to lag the economic activity they may not be in a position to forecast whether an economic performance is going to be good or not so they lead the economic activity if there are huge investments being done that will indicate that the economy is going to perform better this may go up may come down and may not really indicate and lagging indicators are those which are going to be the end result after the economy is going through a tough phase or a weak <coughs> if it's going through a tough phase or a growth phase the performance of this will come only at the end so an example of a lagging indicator is loans of corporates if there is a very good economic growth which is happening 
then the loans of corporates may gradually come down but that will only reflect once how the economy performs so it may not be in a you may not be in a position to forecast how the economy is going to perform through a lagging indicator so i have a leading indicator coincidental indicator and lagging indicator all these indicators may sometimes give conflicting signals one may say that the economy is going up the other may say that the economy is coming down so i'll have to try to uh, manage that and also it will just suggest what is the direction of the chip it can only tell that the economy is going to go up or come down it cannot say that economy will go up by 10 percent or a 15 percent or a 20 percent so this is one more approach which is there the third approach is an economic model building approach now what is an economic model building approach is the GNP growth or the GDP growth you try to find out the various factors which can contribute to the GDP growth example consumption investments government expenses so the various factors which are going to affect the economic growth you try to find them once you try to find the various factors which are going to contribute to the economic growth so then you add up all of them and forecast what is the GDP growth going to be so after forecasting individual components add them up to obtain the forecasted GDP and forecasting will happen by various components consumption private domestic investment government purchases and the net result is I will get a GNP growth by adding up the various components I will also get an independent forecast of a GNP growth and try to check for consistency so this is as far as your economic analysis is concerned so of the EIC approach the first part which we have focused is on economic analysis the objective of economic analysis is to forecast the national income or the income growth which is going to be there there are various factors which go into it one are the growth rates in the growth rates of industrial sector inflation monsoon and there are few techniques which are done one is an anticipatory survey where we try to get the views of the experts barometer or indicator approach where we have leading indicator lagging indicator and roughly coincidental indicators and we also have an economic model building approach where we try to find out the various factors which are contributing to the GDP growth and try to forecast the individual components and then add up to the overall GDP growth or the GNP growth next is industry analysis so first we are focused on economic analysis now we are going to focus on the industry analysis now what is industry analysis is you are basically concerned with analyzing what is going to be the expected performance of that specific industry so analyzing the expected performance of the specific industry to which the company belongs so I can try to forecast the growth of automobile industry automobile industry will have different factors which can contribute to the growth I can try to forecast the growth of telecom industry I can try to forecast the growth of IT industry so different factors are going to uh, impact the industry growth rates for example IT industry the uh, IT industry growth is predominantly dependent on how the other economies perform because most of the time the IT companies derive a significant proportion of their revenues from exports automobile industry the cars they do not involve more on export so they are depend on the domestic market so you will have to analyze the demand pattern cost structure and then analyze how the industry is going to perform now there are various factors which can contribute to the industry growth rate one thing which you can remember is Porter's five forces model if I have to analyze at a company level so at a company level if you have to analyze I will try to go through a Porter's five forces model to understand how my company is going to perform within the industry here the various factors which we will see I will see product life cycle cost structure profitability
demand supply scenario entry barriers these are few aspects which i'll end up seeing to evaluate how the industry is going to perform so product life cycle is going through industry growth maturity and decline so you will have to understand which phase is the industry in and that will help you in analyzing the growth of the industry so it can be high profitability in the initial medium in the maturity and a sharp decline in the last stage of the growth an example uh, if you take <coughs> cameras cameras were having a very good demand maybe 10 years back moment mobile phones came in the demand for cameras have been consistently coming down and now the demand for cameras have almost become very less because cameras had reached a decline stage in the industry so certain industries could be in the growth stage certain industries could be in the introduction stage certain industries could be in the maturity stage and certain can be in the decline stage next demand supply gap if at all there is a demand supply gap then that can lead to a very good uh, growth rate uh, if there is a high demand for a company and the supply is not sufficient to meet the demand so then what can happen is the companies can grow at a very healthy rate so you will have to see whether there is an excess supply or there is an insufficient supply if there is an excess supply profitability will come down if there is an insufficient supply the profitability levels can improve for the company next barriers to entry if there are a lot of entry barriers then what will happen is uh, you will have a very good profitability so you will have to check whether there are any barriers to entry if there are good barriers to entry the existing set of companies will perform well if there are no barriers to entry then things can be weak for a company uh, state of competition in the industry entry barriers these two are porters five forces model parts i'm not explaining much <coughs> pretty much straightforward simple explanation cost structure and profitability and one more important factor is research and development or research and technology so if a lot of companies are spending more on research and development that can try to give them a core competence it can also help the industry and the company to perform well now what are the various techniques uh, which we use for industry analysis i can do regression or a correlation analysis or i can also do an input output analysis now a regression analysis basically can be a single variable regression analysis or something called as a multiple variable regression analysis now what is regression analysis is trying to find a link between independent variable and a dependent variable one classic example is let's assume i have an ice cream business so when i have an ice cream business what can happen is that uh, the temperature which is there uh, so if there are very high temperatures it can lead to good demand for ice cream and if the temperatures are coming down if the climate uh, if you are having a hot summer you will see the demand for ice creams to go up and if they are in winter the demand for ice creams can come down so one important factor are the two variables which i'm going to analyze is temperature and the relationship between the temperature and the demand of the ice cream player similarly there can be multiple factors also which can impact i'm just again talking about a company level i'll come to the industry level analysis in some time from a company point of view you can see that uh, multiple regression can be done where there are many variables which can impact so an example of multiple variables which can impact a business sales uh, can be your let's take price of the product and the temperature and let's assume my capacity so if my capacity is going up i can increase my revenues if i have a high price maybe the revenues will come down because high price may lead to lower demand so there can be multiple factors so in regression analysis we try to establish this relationship that is we try to establish a relationship between a no uh, one factor and the other factor 
factor in this analysis so various factors which we consider is GNP disposable income per capita and consumption price elasticity for identifying factors affecting demand statistical techniques like regression analysis comma correlation are used the other approach is input output analysis now what is input output analysis is uh, identifying the flow of goods uh, as they move from the various uh, steps in the production process that is from the raw material stage to the final consumption a detailed analysis of this can help me in detecting if there are any changing patterns or trends are there any growth or decline of industries so I have two techniques to do industry analysis one is regression or a correlation analysis the other technique which I have is uh, <coughs> input output analysis now I'll go to the third part of your fundamental analysis which is on company analysis now they have given huge number of factors for company analysis I'll focus on few of them talk uh, some important information about the few factors which are there so what this company analysis is doing the analysis of that individual company now there are various factors which can impact book value return on equity uh, growth track record ratio analysis a ratio or financial analysis important factors quality of management or corporate governance these are some important factors which will go into my company analysis so first is net worth or book value analysis now you net worth is basically something which is known to you net worth is basically equity capital plus reserves and surplus I'll deduct any carry forward losses or any fictitious asset now uh, if I divide the net worth by the number of shares I'll get the book value per share I would want the market price to be at least more than the book value of share if the market price is less than the book value of share that can indicate that markets is not valuing this company a lot next sources and uses of funds this is basically fund flow statement one important principle is any long term sources of money that is equity capital reserves and surplus preference capital any long term sources of money should always be used for long term purposes that is like buying a fixed asset and any short term sources of money should be used for your short term purposes like working capital so I'll have to ensure that uh, is to find out whether any short term sources have been used for long term investment this can lead to liquidity crunch for a company uh, cross sectional analysis or time series analysis is basically comparing two firms or comparing a single company over period of time uh, size and ranking is understanding where does the company stand within an industry an example is uh, let's take uh, Maruti Suzuki. Maruti Suzuki has around 50% market share in the industry. So that is a substantial portion of the industry size or a substantial portion of the market share. The past growth records can also help me in understanding how the company is going to perform. Financial analysis is technically doing a ratio analysis. Financial solvency, liquidity analysis, efficiency analysis. So certain ratios will be used by the company. And these ratios will help me in indicating how the company is going to perform over the medium term the next part is on competitive advantage competitive advantage is basically core competence or the unique strength of so one unique strength could be the brand name which is there so this brand strength like Apple and Samsung their brand strength has been helping them to uh, grow despite increasing competition this is the most important factor which will finally play a part in the overall growth of the company which is your intangible it looks like an intangible factor it's very difficult to measure this so we will have to see how the com how this management has performed over the past few years how they have uh, reacted in different uh, situations whether they have done something which is good for the minority investors whether they have taken right set of decisions whether it it basically helps me in measuring competence integrity 
and risk appetite risk appetite is taking unnecessary risk if you take very un uh, if you take unnecessary risk it can again lead to problems for the company a uh, corporate governance and quality of management is kind of interlinked other things is you have certain regulations to be met labor laws to be met how you are uh, performing in how you are taking care of your employees are there any issues with the employees so all of that needs to be seen so pattern of existing short stockholding shareholding pattern can also indicate whether there are any big investors in the company whether mutual funds is investing in the company so that is also important and uh, there should also be a marketability people should be buying and selling the shares there should be a lot of purchase and sale which should happen if there is no major purchase and sale happening then what can happen is that you don't know how will you move out of this company uh, now what are the various techniques which we use in company analysis first is correlation and regression analysis correlation and regression is same as industry level analysis and at a company level in industry level also i explained you that it can be a single regression analysis or a multiple regression analysis so you try to find interrelationship so cover simple regression is for two variables for more than two variables you do regression multiple regression analysis this will help you in finding out how the company is going to perform second part is trend analysis looking at the past performance and predicting how the future is going to be so it gives an insight on the historical uh, behavior uh, the third part is your decision tree analysis decision tree is you try to find out what can happen this is how your decision tree work then again look at what can be the different things which can happen the company can grow at maybe 5% it can grow at 10% next year if it goes at 5% it can even go up to 10 15% somewhere trying to find out uh, probability of occurrence and decision is sequentially attached to each sequence and you finally try to value this so this is what is fundamental analysis is all about so i'll do a <coughs> separate video again on technical analysis so till now we have done fundamental analysis so in fundamental analysis what we have focused is on eic analysis which is economic industry and company analysis so we first started with economic analysis economic analysis is trying to forecast what will be the national income with its various components there are four factors which affect them growth rates of national economy growth rates of industrial sector inflation monsoon there are three techniques to do this one is your barometer or barometer or indicator approach anticipatory surveys are an economic model building approach then we saw something called as industry analysis which is trying to analyze individual industries how are they going to perform again there are multiple factors which can impact it uh, some of the factors of porter's five forces model come into picture like barriers to entry uh, intensity of competition product life cycle research and technology government attitude and what are the techniques we use we use a regression analysis or a correlation analysis to find out this and also an input output analysis at a company level there are various factors the important one are quality of management corporate governance competitive advantage net worth and book value whether they are complying with regulations labor issues <coughs> financial analysis ratio analysis so all of this will come into picture and uh, what are the techniques we use is we use three techniques here correlation and regression analysis trend analysis and decision tree analysis okay uh, now we will uh, start with uh, technical analysis in till now we have seen what is fundamental analysis which is basically your eic analysis economic industry and company analysis now coming to technical analysis this is another way of doing a analysis and deciding when to buy a share and when to sell a share so that analysis can be done through a technical analysis as well uh, just a minute So what is technical analysis is all about it. It basically tries to find out share price movements based on the past graph. So let's assume this is a share price graph. Uh, this is the price. So it goes up, comes down. This is how a share has moved. 
now what technical analysis says is that whatever has happened in the past is likely to get repeated so in future also the movements may be more or less like this whatever has happened in the past so whatever movements are happening on the price side in the past similar movements are expected to be repeated in future and if that creates repeated there's a possibility that you will be in a position to find when do you have to enter uh, so if looking at this past patterns if i decide that what is going to happen in future i may try to buy this company at this point of time sell this company at this point of time if at all i am able to find the past patterns and those past patterns are likely to be repeated in future so technical analysis is a method of share price movements based on study of price graphs or charts that share prices are repetitive because this is your share price trend is basically depend on the psychology of the investors and that if have happened in the past is likely to happen in future as well now what does a technical analyst try to do is is there any detectable trend in the price and is the trend going to reverse once i try to find that i will try to enter into the company there are two ways of doing it so one is visual and second is statistical visual is going through various set of charts which are there statistical is going through the past data and trying to make a decision now important part is in this chapter on technical analysis i am not going to focus into interpretation of the charts because technically i am also not a person who has a knowledge on technical analysis and i can comment on how do i interpret the charts properly so i will talk about certain aspects which are there certain theories which are important from technical analysis point of view but not exactly the interpretation which is there now certain assumptions are there as far as technical analysis is concerned what assumptions are there is the market value of the stock depends on demand and supply gap and the supply and demand gap is normally governed by several factors and technical analysis says that a stock price movement happens in trends and which is likely to continue for a substantial period of time so depend on supply and demand are actually governed by several factors move in trends which continue for a substantial period of time so technical analysis normally focuses on chart analysis of the past trends in stock prices and not the balance sheet and pnl of a company i'm not really bother about balance sheet and pnl of a company there are certain important principles which are there three important principles is market discounts everything price moves in trends and history is likely to repeat itself market discounts everything it means that uh, technical analysis does not is focuses only on price movements and ignores fundamental factors but the technical analysis also says that markets are highly efficient and if markets are highly efficient the stock price will already factor in all the factors that can affect a company so they normally have a view that company share price includes everything which is fundamental price moves in trends and these trends are likely to repeat itself now in that the first thing which we are going to see is a dow jones theory now dow jones theory was introduced by mr charles dow he had introduced this and uh, this dow jones theory normally has two indices there is dow jones industrial average and a dow jones transportation average this was mostly used in the us market so he had constructed these two indices what these two indices were doing is if dow jones industrial average is moving up then ideally the dow jones transportation average should also start moving up in future or if dow jones transportation average is moving up dow jones industrial average should also start moving up if both start moving up it will kind of indicate a bullish market what was dow jones industrial average trying to indicate is the aggregate performance of the various companies and transportation average is basically the freight industry so that has to normally move up now there are three kinds of classifications which happens as far as your dow jones theory is concerned or your dow theory is concerned there's a primary movement there is a secondary movement and there are daily fluctuations which happen primary movement is normally for a period of maybe a 3 year or a 4 year period which is a longer period and it does basically can be something like a bull market or a bear market this is the overall a uh, movement of the market is the main trend of the market your secondary movement will work opposite to the primary market when you are in a bull market 
there will be few months in between where the prices will crash downwards so those are opposite moments and secondary moments so in a bull market prices coming down is secondary moment in a bear market bear market is a bull market is one where prices uh, are continuously going up a bear market is one where prices are continuously coming down but even in a bull market or a bear market there will be an opposite moment which is secondary moment and then you have daily fluctuations which normally finally add up to the overall moments now interpretation of the bull or a bear market is uh, what happens is this theory says that there will be successive ups then downs will happen then again ups will happen downs will happen ups downs ups down if my successive ups and downs so that is this up and this down and if i compare this up and this down if my successive ups and successive downs are higher than the earlier ups and downs then we are in a bull market and if my successive ups and successive downs are lower than the earlier market which could be a scenario like this then we are in a bear market so that is what this theory indicated propose that the primary up sorry the theory in practice cyclical swings successively higher and successive lows are higher than the market is up and a bullish market exists and there are three moves which normally happen in a bull market and a bear market the first set is people who are knowledgeable set of investors who accumulate the wealth far sighted knowledgeable investors the second uh, the company started reporting good earnings so other people and third there is a huge speculation which happens and a movement happens so in the first stage knowledgeable investors buy it second stage company starts uh, giving a better earning and in the third stage there is some speculation which happens and because of that people start buying it now once the third stage comes in the third stage will also indicate that prices have gone up significantly up and there is a possibility that company may not be in a position to perform and now there is a possibility of lower performance so once the third stage comes in that will become the first stage of the bear market so once the third stage of the bull market comes in the knowledgeable investors will move out of the company towards the far sighted investors who start selling and come down and earnings are not coming in the second move down will happen and then the third move down will happen which will lead to distress selling at, at this stage of distress selling again the knowledgeable set of investors will start coming in next is this was as far as dow theory is concerned so dow theory talked about two indices three types of uh, patterns which are there three classifications primary moment secondary moment and daily classification what does a bull market or a bear market how do you interpret and what are the three stages or three moves of a bull and a bear market now comes the elliot wave theory what this theory has indicated is that markets normally exhibit certain repeated patterns or waves so certain repeated patterns or waves will be there and once the movement of one change in the direction to the next change happens there are a lot of waves which get created now i'll show you the chart for the elliot wave theory just okay this is how the elliot wave theories this is wave 1 wave 2 wave 3 wave 4 wave 5 wave 3 wave 4 wave 5 wave 6 wave 7 wave 8 so there are this is how the markets can perform and in this stage if you see this five wave 1 to wave 5 whatever you are seeing that's basically there are two types of patterns one is called as impulsive patterns or basic waves and second is corrective patterns or reactive waves so you have an impulsive patterns as well as corrective patterns as far as this uh, elliot wave theory is concerned so impulsive patterns in this pattern there will be three or five waves in a given direction going upward or downward this waves will detect the basic movement this can be a bull market or a bear market and an opposite of that will happen in the corrective patterns and one complete cycle consists of waves of two distinct phases on completion of one full cycle the next cycle will start again with the same movements so this chart which you see here this chart which you see up movement can also be a down movement chart initially 5 sorry 
and then a correction will happen and you start going upwards so there is a possibility of a bull movement there's a possibility of a bear movement as well the next theory is so as far as Elliott wave theory is concerned you will have to understand about two types of waves one is called impulsive patterns and corrective patterns impulsive patterns are basically uh, the basic movements which are happening and uh, that indicates whether it's a bull phase or a bear phase and corrective patterns is going to be the opposite of the impulsive patterns random walk theory has indicated that it is impossible for anybody to predict stock market because uh, what happens is whatever is a stock market prices it is dealt by so many people and it is impossible for us to establish a relationship between the price and the future prices so in fact it's like uh, it's like a roulette wheel so what happens is if you see suitably designed roulette wheel so when I try to throw in that number it can go and stick to any number it can be 2 it can be 10 it can be 15 it can be 20 it can be 25 and it's impossible for anybody to predict the stock market prices that is what random walk theory is saying the hypothesis is random walk which states that behavior of stock market prices is unpredictable so the key points is you cannot <coughs> predict it uh, the reason is price trends are not result of any underlying factors and there can be successive ups or downs now we'll focus on various market indicators the first indicator is breadth index now what is breadth index is it is going to cover all the securities which are traded and we calculate it as net advance or declines either you go by net advance by number of issues traded or net declines by number of issues traded and this theory can support what the Dow Jones averages are indicating if it supports then there is a technical strength that is called as technical strength and sometimes it may not support then it is called as technical weaknesses so breadth index is the first thing which we see the breadth index can either support or contradict the movement of the Dow Jones averages the second part is volume of transactions a rising price with rising volume volume basically indicates number of shares bought and sold in a single day so if the share price is moving up and the volumes are also moving up that will indicate there is a buy uh, signal and if the share prices are coming down and volumes are also uh, share prices are coming down and volumes are again going up that will indicate that there is a bear market so volumes going up with share prices going up is a buy signal volumes going up share prices coming down which means people are still not able to sell it and more people are going to sell next is a confidence index uh, this basically indicates how willing the people are to take a risk in the market so you try to calculate a ratio called as high grade bond yields to low grade bond yields once you get this you will be uh, using this index uh, using this confidence index to understand whether the market is likely to move up or uh, move down uh, if the confidence index is moving up if there is an improvement in the confidence index so confidence index is calculated high grade bond yield is let's assume seven percent low grade bond yield is ten percent so this is how I calculate the confidence index and if there is a rising confidence index it is normally expected to precede a rising stock market so if confidence index is moving up it means the stock market is likely to move up in future next is relative strength analysis uh, so what is relative strength analysis is uh, it says that prices of some securities rise relatively fast in a bull market similarly it declines slowly in a bear market so these are set of companies which perform significantly better in a bull market and also when there is a bear market their performance the weak performance is on the lower side so if you invest in these securities you will earn higher returns because they have demonstrated relative strength in the past next is odd lot theory what is odd lot theories this is also known as 
contrary opinion theory now why it is also called as contrary opinion theory is that what it says is uh, you can use an odd lot theory to predict the tops in the bull markets and also to predict reversals in the individual securities normally in a bull market everyone would be trying to buy securities but if you go and act something opposite to the contrary opinion opposite to the popular opinions because everybody is expecting that the prices will go up so in that scenario if you work opposite to what everyone is doing that's called as odd lot theory so Average person is usually, it assumes that average person is usually wrong and that a wise course of action is to pursue strategy contrary to the popular opinion. So you follow something which is opposite to the popular opinion that is can help you in finding out tops in the bull market. So till now in technical analysis what we have seen is we started with understanding what is technical analysis. Technical analysis is basically analyzing the share price movements, finding out the patterns in the share price movements and predicting that whether these patterns can work in future and because of that you can find an entry point and an exit point there can be a visual way of doing it or a statistical way of doing it so you can do it in the visual approach you can also do it in the statistical approach there are certain assumptions of technical analysis the assumptions is it depends on the supply and demand and supply and demand is normally depend on several factors and there are certain patterns and these patterns are likely to be repeated three important principles of technical analysis one is market is going to discount everything uh, the second important principle is price moves and trends and third is history is going to repeat itself then we saw Dow theory where we have two averages Dow Jones industrial average and Dow Jones transportation average we have three way of classification primary movement secondary movement and daily fluctuations and I can use the uh, this averages to find a bull or a bear market if in practice if the cyclical uh, if the upswings the successive ups and downs are higher than the earlier ups and downs it's a bull market similarly if they are lower it's a bear market and normally there are three movements which happen in a bull or a bear market uh, the first movement is accumulation of shares by knowledgeable set of investors the second movement is by company uh, declaring good set of earnings third situation is the third movement is basic uh, the third movement happens when people are going to speculate so once you reach the third stage of a bull market the bear market will start where the knowledgeable investors would move out of the company and then the other the company will not declare uh, good earnings and then uh, there is a distress selling again a bull market will start Elliott wave theory basically talked about something called as two ways there is one is impulsive patterns and corrective patterns totally eight waves can get created random walk theory has said that nobody can predict what can happen in the stock market so we have seen various market indicators we saw breadth index we saw volume of transactions confidence index and relative strength analysis now what is support and resistance level uh, <coughs> I'll show the chart to explain support and resistance level okay this is a data of the company and this is where a chart has been uh, designed now a support resistance is the top part above this I think it is not the share price is not going up so there is a resistance at that level a support level is somewhere here below this the share price is not going down from the chart it appears that support and resistance level were about 100 and 125 uh, I have analyzed for company B so company B they are indicating at around 160 and 140 so somewhere the support and resistance levels are basically indicating the top part and the low lowest part of the prices so when we are closer to the support level uh, there's a possibility that the share price will start moving up when the index or price goes down from a peak the peak becomes a resistance level rebounds after reaching a trough the lowest value becomes a support level the price is normally expected to move between these levels if the price approaches the resistance level uh, because that's the top part there will be a selling pressure and when you reach the support level there will be a buying pressure 
now what are the tools to interpret price patterns i'm not explaining much on this there are certain tools which are given in your material uh, you can look at the chart uh, if what you can go through the explanation you can look at the chart if required but i'm not explaining in detail because this is something where you need a detailed understanding of technical analysis so you have a head and shoulder pattern a triangle or a co coil formation can be there or a double top form can be there or a double bottom form can be there or a gaps can be there so all of this so there's a channel wedge head and shoulders triangular or coil formation double top form double bottom form gap all of this you can go through understand it because this can help us in interpreting the price movements but again i'm repeating you will not be in a position to analyze the chart so easily and make a decision and don't try to invest in stock markets by just doing this bit of technical analysis because you know so many charts and now you can find whether the share price is likely to go up or likely to come down i wouldn't want people to get into something like a stock marketing investing just because of this stock marketing investing should be practiced after doing lot of analysis lot of research understanding well about the fundamental side as well as the technical side the so next is uh, moving average analysis now again just now when it comes to moving average analysis i can do a 5 day moving average i can do a 10 day moving average i can do something called as a exponential moving average so these are the data for 10 periods 5 day moving average is the last 5 days price uh, total so they have taken the last 5 days and put a total this is two item center total is total of this and then this number has been divided by 10 so on day 6 the moving average has been 25.5 the actual is 26 on day 7 the actual is 26.5 the moving average the past history is suggesting 25.65 now why do i uh, do this moving average analysis is it can help me in identifying a buy signal or a sell signal for example the stock price line uh, this 25 26 25.5 24.5 if you prepare a line for this just a, okay if you prepare a chart for this 25 26 27 then what will happen is if this line <coughs> uh, the stock price line through the moving average line uh, is so the stock price line through the moving average line when graph of the moving average line is flattering out or the stock price line falls below the moving average line which is rising if the stock price is below and moving average line is rising it will indicate a buy signal and opposite will indicate a sell signal or the stock price line is always above the moving average line which is falling and again it starts rising so there are two three way, uh, signals which are there technically i am not a very competent person to explain on technical analysis so what i am trying to do is i am just trying to explain basics the important part of technical analysis is there are certain patterns which will be there and there is a likelihood of these patterns getting repeated in future so once these patterns get repeated in future it gives you <coughs> once these patterns are likely to be repeated in future you will know whether the stock price is likely to move up in future or likely to come down in future and accordingly you can buy or sell securities now what are the arguments in favor and against technical analysis so there are people who are supporting technical analysis there are also people who are saying we do not agree to technical analysis now supporters of technical analysis basically says that uh, there is a crowd psychology which normally persist for some time so this if the psychology is going to persist for some time using the technical analysis i can find early trends once i find early trends i can invest in the company also the shift which happens in the demand and supply is normally gradual it is not something which is going to be instantly happening so if it's gradual then what happens is it is easy for me to predict the future movements so crowd psychology tools to help in identifying these trends is gradual rather than instantaneous 
and technical analysis can help me in identifying the shift early and provide clues for future price movements and as far as fundamental information it's already <coughs> taken care by the market so if it's already taken care by the market what is the point of doing fundamental analysis uh, why people do not like technical analysis most of the times when a person does any technical analysis he will not be in a position to give any convincing explanation as to why the price is going to move up or why the price is going to come down so it is very difficult for you to provide a logical explanation the one thing which we can see is the past charts are there and based on the past charts we believe that this is what is going to happen but it is still not possible for them to give a logical explanation as to what is going to happen also uh, there is this random walk theory which was uh, uh, talking about uh, which said that uh, it is impossible for anybody to predict stock markets if it's impossible to predict stock markets then what is the point of doing technical analysis where is the patterns going to be happen so empirical evidence in support of random walk hypothesis so uh, technical analysis uh, uh, the other important part is if more and more people do technical analysis everyone will start forming an early trend and the trends will start reversing them so that is why there are few people who are uh, considering that technical analysis is good there are also set of people who believe that technical analysis is not that uh, not something which should be practiced and you should focus more on the fundamental analysis side now the next part is efficient market theory and what are the major misconceptions what is efficient market theory is whatever price sensitive information that should fully get reflected in the securities prices if you announce a new capital expenditure and that capital expenditure is going to give positive npv that npv should get reflected in the share price we saw this when we were doing rights issue analysis so what happens is this theory basically indicates this whatever is price sensitive information everything should get factored in the share price at any given time all available is fully reflected in securities so you cannot continuously outperform the market because the security will trade mostly at its intrinsic value it will not trade above it will not trade below and why cannot consistent outperformance happen there are a lot of ace investors in the market example rakesh tanjanwala he is considered to be an ace investor he has uh, been giving consistent outperformance but it is not that every year there can be a consistent outperformance because information about the company is freely and instantaneously available also there is a good amount of competition among various market participants and because of that there is a huge forces of demand and supply and the share price will have to be closer to the intrinsic value only if new information comes that is the only time uh, you can see the uh, security moving significantly up or down and that can lead to a outperformance if i'm able to predict something uh, something which is going to happen down two years down the line three years the down and if i'm able to predict that and then i buy the company i can do outperformance but normally the new set of information is very difficult for someone to predict now there are certain misconceptions one efficient market theory says that market price will factor in all available information uh, so this is a misconception that you cannot earn consistent long term returns you can continue to earn consistent long term returns that is possible but outperformance is something may not be possible uh, market sometimes do bring in surprises and because of that prices do fluctuate and also there is a random movement which happens in stock prices which means investors are irrational rational set of investors rational means making the right decision if there is a rational set of investors in the market then what will happen is prices will always move in one direction and everyone would be wanting to buy the security or sell the security everybody would want to buy but in the stock market trading happens when one person wants to buy the security other person wants to sell the security and some of the purchases can be irrational so randomness and irrationality if investors are rational and competitive price changes are bound to be random 
now the market efficiency can have a weak form of efficiency this is a semi strong form of efficiency or a strong form of efficiency weak form of efficiency is prices reflect only the information in the form of past prices and volumes uh, semi strong of efficiency not only the past data but also other publicly available information is factored in and uh, strong form of efficiency prices reflect all information whatever information is there in the market if everything is reflected in the stock price it's a strong form of efficiency past data only is considered then it is a weak form of efficiency if you consider past data as well as other publicly available information now what are the challenges to the efficient market theory efficient market theory or challenges are technically or misconceptions which is there uh, my stock price should ideally be at the intrinsic value if you are having a strong form of efficiency but that is not available so there are a lot of people who invest in stock markets and they may not have the ability to process this information uh, so because of this it is difficult for people to predict exactly what is what is the right price for the security second is irrational behavior irrational behavior is also an important aspect uh, investors are not normally rational so if they are not rational what will happen is your stock prices and intrinsic values may not have a close correspondence because people are irrational you will not have a logic as to why they are buying a company you also do not have a logic as to why they are selling a company also if there is any monopolistic influence monopolistic is if there are any powerful institution and big operators they can also end up impacting the market in a big way so as far as technical analysis is concerned it basically works on the stock share price movements so based on the share price movements it tries to find a trend and these trends are likely to be repeated in future there are three important uh, principles market discounts everything price moves and trends and history tends to repeat itself we saw dow theory which talked about two indices dow jones industrial average dow jones transportation average three classification primary secondary and daily fluctuation i interpret the bull and bear market by successive ups and successive lows and there are three stages of your bull or bear market then we have elliot wave theory where there can be five uh, waves of uh, in a given direction either upward or downward which is impulsive patterns and then you have a corrective patterns a uh, random walk theory which said that you cannot predict how the stock prices are going to move there are various uh, market indicators we saw we saw in indicators like breadth index was on we saw confidence index or uh, confidence level <coughs> uh, we saw relative strength analysis we saw odd lot theory which was there volume of transactions support and resistance levels is resistance is the top uh, the top <coughs> share price or the peak share price and uh, support level is the bottom share price or the trough level uh, there are tools to interpret price patterns which i have not explained much uh, linking of moving averages to a buying and a selling signal and finally uh, we saw uh, there are certain supporters of technical analysis there are people who do not believe in technical analysis and we saw efficient market theory efficient market theory is also one important area efficient market theory basically says the share price should reflect all available price sensitive information and practically the market efficiency can be at a weak form of efficiency semi strong form of efficiency and a strong form of efficiency and there are challenges to this theory because uh, investors do not have the ability to process this information also what happens is there is an irrational behavior and there can be a monopolistic influence so this takes care of this chapter 3 where we saw something on fundamental analysis as well as on economic analysis fundamental analysis and technical analysis fundamental was eic economic industry and company analysis technical analysis basically on price movements okay uh, let's start with uh, chapter 4 which is on security valuation now security valuation is basically going to talk about valuation of different kind of securities it can be equity shares it can be debentures it can be bonds convertible instruments <coughs> 
so the focus of this chapter is on valuation of these security the first question is differentiate between expected return and required rate of return now required rate of return is nothing but what an investor expects just a moment whatever an investor is expecting that's basically called as the required rate of return and most of the times whenever we are doing so first concept is required rate of return most of the times when we do valuation discounting will be done with the help of this so this could be 12 percent expected rate of return is basically the real IRR of the cash flow which could be 14 percent so I need 12 percent but the security can give me 14 percent rate of return so required rate of return is the minimum return which an investor wants to need expected rate of return is what the return the security can give the higher than the required return then the share is undervalued and if it is lower then it's overvalued and the difference is technically called as alpha you will learn about what is alpha in a chapter called portfolio management so the difference between the expected return and the required rate of return is technically called as alpha what is equity risk premium now uh, whenever I'm investing in an equity security uh, equity shares they are tend to give a return which is normally higher than the risk free rate return and we called as expected return is equal to beta plus sorry RF plus beta into RM minus RF this part is called as the risk premium the extra return the security is going is the excess return that investment in equity shares provides over a risk free rate <coughs> high risk investments will have high risk return and equity risk premiums will be beta of security into market return minus risk free return okay next there's a concept called as nominal cash flow and real cash flow now here nominal cash flow real cash flow real cash flow is it's going to be 10 10 10 10 10 no increase at all nominal cash flow for the first year let it be 10 but then there is an inflation effect 10 percent inflation and this will keep going up because of the inflation there is an increase in the value of the cash flow but in reality there's nothing happening earlier I was making a profit of 10 rupees by selling 10 units I continue to sell the same 10 units but my profit slightly goes up because of the inflationary impact which is there so nominal cash flow include inflation real cash flow is excluding the impact of inflation so it's the amount of future revenues the company expects to earn without any adjustment so I don't adjust it and I leave it so it includes the effect of inflation with adjustments for inflation since inflation reduces I exclude the inflationary impact in the short term under conditions of low inflation if there are low inflation then both will be same if there are high inflation nominal cash flow will be higher than the real cash flow then next concept which we are seeing is enterprise value we had already touched upon enterprise value as part of problem solving also enterprise value is basically the true economic value of a company uh, normally when I'm valuing a company I should will be putting a value for debt as well as equity of the company and the owners of the company in most of the concepts of the finance the owners of the company are not only the equity shareholders they are also the debt holders because the uh, focus of the debt holders is also they also have a keen interest that the company should perform well if a company is not performing well then debt guys will also be losing their money equity guys will lose their money debt guys will also lose their money so what uh, a debt investor would normally expect us that the company should perform well and if the company is performing well they will get back their interest and principal which has been given so there is an implicit or an inherent expectation of the debt guys that the, it it 
<clears throat> there's an inherent expectation from a debt com debt holder point of view is that the company should perform well and true economic value or an e enterprise values equity plus debt i adjusted for cash and cash equivalents because these are not invested by the company so when i'm acquiring a company if i'm paying 5000 lakhs the enterprise value could be only 4500 because immediately there could be a 500 lakhs of cash which will come to me so total enterprise value is <coughs> I adjust for cash and cash equivalents. In operating enterprise value, I'll adjust for any uh, non-operating assets such as investments in associates. And here I'll deduct any non-core assets like land and building, plant and machinery, which is not utilized by the company. Also, normally we use two multiples in relating to the enterprise value. One is on the enterprise value to sales and second is enterprise value to EBITDA. So what we will do is we'll calculate the enterprise value to sales uh, of uh, Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, Wipro, CTS and then do a comparison to understand which companies are undervalued, which companies are overvalued. In order to do a comparison between two companies, EV2 sales and EV2 EBITDA approach can really help me. Okay, next duration. Duration is basically the time period at which the company is not exposed to any interest rate risk. So when, when an investor is investing in a bond, he should have a time period of investment and he should ensure that his time period of investment is equal to the duration of the bond. This will ensure that I am not exposed to interest rate risk. So what they say is duration is the average time taken by an investor to collect his or her investment. Uh, there's another definition. It also says the time period by which uh, the bond cash flows are repaid to the investor. So if a bond is paying some interest every year, then the duration of the bond will be slightly lower than the <coughs> normal maturity of the instrument. And your bond duration depends on time to maturity and coupon rate. Next, immunization. Immunization is a concept which I was just explaining. What happens is if interest rates goes up, then although return on investment improves, but the bond price falls. So there are two types of risks which are there. One is price risk and reinvestment rate risk. If interest rate go up, what will happen is bond price will fall, but I will earn higher on reinvestment. If interest rates come down, bond price will go up, but I will earn lower on reinvestment. So somewhere I will have to balance it. There is a time period at which the loss or gain on bond price will match the loss or gain on reinvestment and that time period is technically called as duration. So if I have to immune my portfolio against the interest rate risk, what we should do is uh, the process of immunization, we should ensure that the effect of the cell offset each other. And immunization happens if the my duration of the portfolio is equal to the period for which the investment is required to be made. I've covered all of this in the theory part. What is term structure theory is? We will know one year interest rate 8%, two year 8.25, three year 8.5, four year 9%, five year 9.5. Now with this interest rates in place, I can try to find out what will be the forward interest rate? So the term structure theory represents relationship between interest rates or bond yields and different terms are maturity. Now, we have three theories. One is an unbiased expectation theory. Second is a liquidity preference theory. And third is a preferred habitat theory. Unbiased expectation theory is, uh, this is what we have done in the class by calculating forward rates. As per this theory, you can find the long-term interest rates, whatever the long-term interest rates are given, that can be used to forecast the short-term interest rates in the future. That is, having the interest rate for year 2 and year 3, you can find what will be the forward rate of year 2 to year 3. Having the interest rate of year 1 and year 2, find out the forward rate of year 1 to year 2. 
liquidity preference theory what this theory says is the forward rates kind of reflects two things one is the future spot rates and also there is a liquidity premium which needs to be paid because uh, people are going to be exposed to the interest rate risk so there should be some kind of a liquidity premium paid long term interest rates can be used to forecast short term interest rates by forecasting some invested for more than one period investors expectation of you plus a liquidity premium preferred habitat theory according to this theory the interest rates are only dependent on supply and demand and there's no relationship between the not to the term of the maturity okay what is convexity adjustment now let me take this example now this is a bond which has a 6 year life it is going to pay 10 rupees every year on the maturity you will get 110 so i have done discounting at 5% and you get a price of 125 there is a weight and there is a product and the duration is 4.93 now in class we would have learnt so 5% price 125.36 if it goes up to 6% or if it goes up to 4% we use <coughs> a concept called as duration so duration in this case is this and volatility is going to be duration divided by 1.05 1 plus ytm so my volatility is and what this concept said is if interest rates go up by 1% or change by 1% the price will change by 4.7% so according to this theory this 125.36 will fall by 4.7% and will increase by 4.7% so if interest rates come down it will have an increase of 4.7% uh, if interest rates come down and if interest rates go up now this basically assumes that there is a linear relationship when i say linear relationship 4% 5% 10% the price was 125 so sorry let's make four the side six the side so at 4% it will be 131 as interest rates go up it will be a straight line according to this it's going to be a straight line because the percentage fall will exactly depend on the change in the interest rates but in real world it doesn't happen that way and there is something like a convexity adjustment to be done now to prove this let me do it at 4% If I do at four percent, the real answer for four percent is one thirty-one point four three, which is almost closer. But exact answer, if you want, it is one thirty-one point four three. And if you do at six percent, it is one one nine point. Six seven. So the actual answer kind of varies slightly. If you do, uh, if you go by your normal adjustments, it doesn't work. So if I do six percent, I get one one nine point six seven as the actual answer. And if I do four percent, I get an answer as one thirty one point four three. So to do this, there is something called as a convexity adjustment to be done. In fact, we should have covered this in class. You can just go through this concept and understand this problem. convexity is another column which is created now how we do convexity is i'm not going to use this formula uh it's better to use the formula which i'm explaining here how to calculate convexity so convexity is equal to you do this that is take the weight multiply it with t square plus t weight into 
t square plus t weight into t square plus t t square is the time period 1 square plus 1 2 square plus 2 3 square plus 3 so weight into t square plus t divided by 1 plus ytm square so let me take it back to 5 percent here so weight into t square plus t divided by 1.05 square weight into t square plus t into divided by 1.05 square weight into t square plus t divided by 1.05 square we keep doing this <coughs> and the convexity is 29 the convexity is going to be 29.11 in this case convexity is 29.11 so let me take this detailed example which is there I'll put the same numbers here 100 coupon rate is 10 percent life in years is 6 years yield is 5 percent frequency is 1 so convexity answer is 29.11 duration is 4.93 modified duration is 4.7 now if interest rates undergo a change if interest rates are going to undergo a change what will happen is what we are going to predict here now if my yield changes by one person that is it increases by one person bond price is going to undergo a change by four point okay yeah if interest rates are going to change by one person the duration concept is going to say that the interest rates will undergo a change by 4.7 percent in reality my actual new price 119.67 the actual fall is 4.53 percent whereas my duration concept is going to say that the interest rate the interest rate change is going to lead to a change of 4.7 percent so duration says fall will be 4.7 percent actual fall is 4.53 percent this is if interest rate go up if interest rate come down interest rates come down duration fall will be duration increase actual increases so if I go by the concept of duration the fall and increase should be 4.7 percent whereas in reality the fall is 4.53 percent whereas the increase is 4.84 percent so there is some slight variation now how do I account for this slight variation which is there because the actual fall is 4.53 percent and actual increases 4.84 percent it's not exactly 4.7 percent that adjustment is done with the help of duration or that is adjustment is done with the help of convexity adjustment so my convexity which I've calculated is 29.11 so I calculate something called as 0 0.5 into convexity which in this case the convexity number is 29.11 into yield change square into yield change square into bond price so 0.5 convexity is 29.11 yield change in this case is 1% And original bond price was 125.38
this will give me a number 0 0.5 into 29.11 into 0.18 this 0.18 is an extra adjustment I will have to do to my answer 0.18 is an extra adjustment which I'll have to do so modified duration has predicted that the fall will be 5.89 rupees convexity adjustment says there has to be a 0.1 adjustment and the actual predicted change will be 5.7 and uh, so I let me explain again once more on the convexity part we do year cash flow PVF DCF weight product which tells you that duration answer convexity is equal to weight into t square plus t weight into t square plus t divided by 1 plus ytm square weight into t square plus t divided by 1 plus ytm square weight into t square plus t divided by 1 plus ytm square the total will give you the convexity once the convexity answer is done what you do is base price 125.36 volatility change I have assumed interest rates will go up by 1% so volatility change is going to be base price into 4.7% so I have done the volatility change which is going to happen now this answer is adjusted for convexity change or convexity impact what is convexity impact is convexity 0.5 into convexity into yield change into the price original price now this will give me the new price base price at 5% new price at 6% so new price at 6% according to this theory has to be 119.65 actual when we do calculation it's 119.67 similarly if I start base price as 125 volatility change this is I am trying to calculate what should be at 4% now convexity adjustment is going to be on there and once the convexity adjustment is given effect you end up getting 131.43 so that is what uh, convexity adjustment does and in this process you will be in a position to get the right price change which is happening this is trying to calculate what will be the price at 4% and this is how convexity will help you in doing a better prediction based on changes in interest rates convexity impact is going to be convexity into 0.5 into change in yield square into the base price and calculation of convexity is weight into t square plus t divided by 1.05 1 point yield ytm square let's not go through this formula this is a better way of doing it next what is a zero coupon bond we have also touched upon this in class zero coupon bond is those bonds which do not pay any interest during the life of the bond they will pay a one time lump sum amount at the end they are also known as deep discount bonds they are normally issued at a discounted price to their face value so the investor will receive one lump sum which is equal to the initial investment plus interest accrued uh, this also is helpful because you will get the returns in the end uh, the only problem is throughout the life of the instrument there will not be anything paid 
and this will also expose to a higher degree of risk because over the longer maturity period if the financial strength of that company weakens we will be having a uh, trouble in getting back the money which we have invested next is arbitrage pricing theory you learn this in detail in portfolio management chapter but what is arbitrage pricing theory is we have a capital asset pricing model which says return in a security is equal to rf plus beta into rm minus rf rf plus beta is equal to rm minus rf now i have a another theory called as arbitrage pricing theory which is going to be an alternative for calculating the required return of a security and according to this theory the required return on a security is not only depend on beta it depends on variety of factors other than beta so how we calculate is we calculate the risk premium for every factor you anyway learn this as part of problem solving itself in um, a chapter on portfolio so as of now the formula is rf plus beta 1 into rp1 plus beta 2 into rp2 and it goes on like this there can be multiple factors so the only important thing which i have explained here is on the convexity part we have not covered this in the class year cash flow pvf dcf weight product convexity is equal to weight into t square plus t divided by 1 plus ytm square put a total of the convexity and i have my base price which is there at 5% volatility will have an impact and there is a convexity impact which is done and this convexity impact will help me in better measuring the right price so if i just do a duration kind of a change if duration will say the fall will be 4.7% increase will be 4.7% but the actual fall is slightly higher or slightly different and that impact can be done through this convexity adjustment so sure. <coughs> okay uh, let's now start with uh, chapter 5 on portfolio management so what are the objectives of portfolio management so portfolio management is basically maintaining a uh, various mix of securities in order to earn a desired return and my portfolio doesn't mean it has to include only equity shares it can be a combination of debt equity uh, it can be preference also being brought in some risk free securities can also been brought in my objective is there should be security there should be capital growth i should get diversification benefit uh there should also be marketability as well as liquidity these are some primary objectives of engaging in portfolio management so security or safety of principal stability of income there should be some stability in the income which i generate income could be in the form of interest or in the form of dividend capital growth marketability marketability and liquidity is more or less similar ability to sell diversification and also if there is a favorable tax status that is if you invest in securities which are having more tax efficient then there is a possibility of earning better returns next what are the various phases of portfolio management a portfolio management goes through a series of five steps the first phase is security analysis which we learnt in the earlier chapter after security analysis i look portfolio analysis so first i do security analysis then i do portfolio analysis after doing that i will do portfolio selection i'll do portfolio selection just a minute
after portfolio selection we will do portfolio revision and my final thing is on portfolio evaluation this is a five phase strategy as far as portfolio management is concerned security analysis portfolio analysis portfolio selection portfolio revision and portfolio evaluation security analysis is basically analyzing the risk returns of the various securities portfolio analysis is finding out a various set of portfolios and choosing which are the efficient portfolios the portfolio analysis is finding out the various set of portfolios and here you are finding out which is an efficient portfolio revision is if at all there are any changes to be done after the portfolio has been constructed and evaluation is analyzing the portfolio over a longer period of time now next is traditional approach of portfolio management now what is traditional approach of portfolio management is first analyze the investor analyze the investor uh, so investor study needs to be done i will do on his demographics uh, on his uh, requirement risk taxation status once that is done i will freeze on what are the objectives of the portfolio so maximizing the investors wealth which is obviously subject to risk then i bring in an investment strategy so in my investment strategy i may have to balance fixed interest securities against equities i may have to balance between high deal high dividend growing companies uh, as compared to high earning growth companies also i'll have to balance between income tax payable against a capital gain tax transaction cost against capital cost so there are a lot of balancing needs to be done so balancing fixed interest security against equity high dividend payout against high earning growth income tax payable against capital gain transaction cost against capital gains and diversification is if if i have to invest in uh, two businesses i should try to invest in those businesses the uh, the factors which impact one business negatively should end up impacting the other business positively that's called as diversification example having a tea or a coffee business with another ice cream business ice cream business is expected to do well in summer season tea or coffee business is expected to do really well in winter season so if i try to do it that way it can make it better for me that in it will reduce the volatility which is there because one business will do well other business will not perform well and then finally i'll have to select the individual securities there are uh, certain principles for selecting so i will try to calculate the true value or intrinsic value either do a fundamental analysis or go through a technical analysis if this is not done you go through expert advice uh, or you get through some information about the newspaper in the newspaper about good track of companies so finally companies which have a good track record good asset backing dividend growth are appropriate are the normal set of companies which will form part of the portfolio next what are the elements of risk in an investment an important question there is systematic risk and unsystematic risk i have two types of risks there's a systematic risk and there is unsystematic risk systematic risk can be interest rate risk these are something which is external to the company purchasing power risk or market risk these are typically external to the company and unsystematic risk is basically business risk and financial risk business and financial so systematic risk comprises factors that are external to the company and affects large number of securities uh, you have interest rate risk which is variation in the interest rates purchasing power is variation in inflation so if inflation rates uh, increase significantly it can cause a erosion in the realized return market risk market risk is this is also a type of systematic risk 
and what happens is price of some shares can move up or down consistently uh, with other shares in the market if a lot of shares are moving up this company will also start moving up if a lot of shares are coming down this share will also come down and that is because of the bull market or the bear market there can be a bullish trend or there can be a bearish trend unsystematic risk are normally factors which are internal to company it's not going to affect all the companies it will affect only this company and it is normally called as business risk and financial risk business risk is basically those factors which are impacting on the business side example business cycles technology changes demand issues and financial risk is on the capital structure side having too much of a debt can be a problem uh, from sale and purchase of security affected by business cycle technological changes and uh, changes in capital structure are the debt equity ratio the major part next we are going to see Markowitz model what are the assumptions of Markowitz model so we have we will learn about Markowitz model as we do problems uh, so they are asking what are the assumptions of the Markowitz model so there are certain base assumptions of a Markowitz model according to the Markowitz model the return uh, of an investment whatever return you are getting that basically summarizes the outcome of the investment the investor can prepare a probability distribution of the various returns and once you prepare a probability distribution it is possible for you to calculate the variance of the return so you can calculate the return of a security you can calculate the variance of the security and you are going to make your purchase decision based on these two criteria one is the return criteria and the risk criteria so that is how uh, this Markowitz model works major thing is return is calculatable uh, cal return can be calculated risk can be calculated and people will make their decision based on this and investors are generally risk averse so they will try to take a minimum level risk for a return and if they want to earn better returns if at all they want to earn better returns then they should be ready to take extra risk or if they are taking some extra risk they would want a higher return and investors are assumed to be rational rational basically indicates that they would prefer greater returns to lesser ones giving equal or smaller risk so if one security can give 14 percent return another security can give 12 percent return and both have same risk obviously the investor would prefer a 14 percent return so this is as far as markowitz model is concerned then we are going to see what are the assumptions of capital asset pricing model markowitz model and capital asset pricing model the assumptions are more or less similar the first major assumption is on efficiency of the market and rational investment goals we saw what is an efficient market is uh, the price of the security should factor in the entire information which is available and all people should have that information existence of financials with full information of risk and return available to all participants rational investment goals is higher return uh, for an acceptable level of risk or lowest risk for a desired level of return and they will try to do risk aversion so risk aversion and rational investment goals we have seen earlier as well so the major thing is there should be an efficient market people will employ something called as a risk aversion and there should be rational investment goals which are there uh, there are other assumptions but the, the most important ones are these three investors are able to borrow freely at risk free rate of interest there will not be any kind of transaction cost no bankruptcy insolvency these are other things but the important one is that now what are the advantages and limitations of CAPM advantages is CAPM can help me in calculating the risk adjusted return for any security which is RF plus beta into RM minus RF it can also help me in valuing a company which does not pay any dividend so it can give me a reasonable basis of calculating risk adjusted return and it is also useful in computing cost of equity in case a company is not paying any dividends there are certain limitations that there is no reliability of the beta uh, because uh, when you are trying to calculate beta you need past information on the returns which the security has generated that data may not be available so if beta cannot be calculated you cannot follow CAPM so whatever limitations are there for beta there are limitations also for the uh, CAPM 
also it emphasizes only on systematic risk which is beta beta is a measure of systematic risk but there are other risks which are also there the other risks are your unsystematic risk and if you have an undiversified portfolio i cannot basically use capm and also it's not possible to get all information on risk free rate and expected return uh, it is very difficult to obtain information and expected return and also there can be multiple risk free rates multiple market returns so it becomes slightly difficult to follow this in the practical world if beta is not calculatable if you cannot calculate beta it is not possible for you to follow this strategy or follow this capital asset pricing model next right short note on active portfolio strategy now you will have two types of strategy one is active portfolio strategy and second is passive portfolio strategy we have an active portfolio strategy and a passive portfolio strategy active portfolio strategy is normally adopted by aggressive investors who want to earn a superior return they want to earn more uh, return they want to generate a positive alpha those set of people would try to follow an active portfolio strategy now active portfolio strategy uh, what is is normally followed by a lot of mutual funds and schemes where they will continuously do an analysis of the financial performance business strategy management characteristics uh, so there are certain uh, principles of your active portfolio strategy one is market timing they would like to time the market and buy the companies at the lowest possible time or invest in securities when the market is at the lowest point so they will try to do something called as a timing of the market uh, which is a little difficult to understand whether the market is going to perform well or not but they will try to time the market so this involves departing from the normal <coughs> so what they will do is they will expect how the market is going to move also there will be something called as a sector rotation or a security rotation so sector rotation is you will keep shifting from one sector to the other sector depending on whether a sector has the outlook of the sector is weak or not may apply both to stock uh, components of portfolio is when it involves shifting and similarly you will do security rotation or a security selection so you will try to find some underpriced securities and try to buy them and sell your overpriced securities also this is a this also involves something called as a specialized investment concept you need to do a lot of research in order to adopt this there should be continuous uh, analysis of the information which is there and you will have to try to find growth stock neglected stock technology stock cyclical stock and by this way you will be able to follow an active portfolio strategy and opposite to this is a passive portfolio strategy where you do not end up uh, changing your asset mix or change your allocation if your portfolio is well diversified and you will try to hold it for a longer period of time an example is index funds the search for a superior return create a well diversified portfolio hold the portfolio over a longer period of time an example is index funds which is there so one is an active portfolio strategy and we also have a passive portfolio strategy next what are the criteria for bond selection we have understood what are the criteria for uh, equity share selection when we did company analysis now for a bond selection point of view i'll focus on something called as yield to maturity that will explain what is the kind of return i'm going to generate from the securities if at all there is any risk of default i can do it with the help of credit rating of the bond so i'll see is there any risk of default any tax benefit which are there and liquidity ability of the company to sell it uh, back what are the three approaches for selection of stock we have seen this in the earlier the three approaches is the two approaches means technical analysis and fundamental analysis these are the only two approaches the third approach they are saying is random selection analysis you can end up buying any security you can end up selling any security so technical analysis looks at the price past prices fundamental analysis looks into factors like earning level growth prospects and random selection is market is efficient and securities properly priced what are the various types of asset 
allocation strategy now this is a critical area it's difficult uh, unless you have a practical exposure of this one is integrated asset allocation second is strategic asset allocation third is tactical asset allocation fourth is insured asset allocation so these are the four types of strategy which can be adopted one is a integrated asset allocation second is a strategic asset allocation technical asset allocation and an insured asset allocation now coming to first i'll talk about what is strategic asset allocation here i decide a combination of debt and equity real estate gold i decide a combination of the various asset classes i want to invest in and i will try to follow this and rebalance the portfolio <coughs> every now and then when it is required so strategic asset allocation is basically having an optimal portfolio mix and doing periodic adjustment depending on what is happening in the market what is tactical asset allocation is what is strategic asset allocation is having a steady mix of debt equity gold or real estate that strategy is kind of rigid rigid there is no flexibility in that strategy so what is tactical allocation asset allocation strategies you will try to deviate from this for a shorter period of time and when you deviate for a shorter period of time you will try to buy certain securities which are expected to give very healthy returns so for a shorter period of time you may increase the equity exposure or you may increase the exposure in gold you may increase the exposure in real estate that's only for a shorter period of time insured asset allocation strategy is very simple there is a base which is set uh, if i'm investing 20 lakhs this value should not come below 15 lakhs so if the value is above 20 lakhs i will continue to keep investing in the companies i'll continue to keep investing in risky assets but moment it reaches 15 lakhs i will not invest in risky securities and i'll start investing only in risk-free securities so here i go by a mix of return risk and covariances and set in a mix and keep adjusting them periodically here i to take a short-term deviation here i will try to to have a minimum level of return which is needed or minimum base value if my asset value is more than that then i will try to keep uh, taking more risk so you will learn about this in a problem called in a problem where we'll do constant portfolio proportion insurance strategy constant portfolio proportion insurance strategy strategic asset allocation strategy is a constant mix strategy where you have a constant mix of debt equity and other things integrated asset allocation is broadly taking into consideration all this strategy which we have decided on and also it takes into consideration the investors risk tolerance level next what are the features of alternative investments so these are not the normal set of investments which we see so alternative investments when you are making what are the kind of uh, uh, benefits or what are the features it has now uh, because this is something like a specific nature there will always be a high fees which needs to be paid these are normally illiquid there will be less transparency on these data and you may have to do a lot of extensive research extensive research needs to be done so high fees limited historical uh, rate illiquidity less transparency extensive research may be needed next how do you value a real estate there are four approaches which are given in your material one is sales comparison approach so in this approach you will try to compare this with a similar property which is there so based on that you can do a valuation comparing with a similar property income approach you will compare you will see the kind of incomes which are getting generated and then uh, this is like a perpetuity you will discount it 
cost approach what will be the cost to build a similar real estate in a nearby location that needs to be taken into consideration or cash flow after tax approach so sales comparison like a price earning multiplied in case of equity shares income approach uh, is like a valuing a perpetuity cost approaches cost is estimated to replace the building and discounted after tax cash flow approach next what is mezzanine finance mezzanine finance is basically hybrid finance which is a mixture of debt plus equity now if i take it from <coughs> the risk point of view equity is considered to be most risky debt is considered to be less risky and the mezzanine will come in between this and uh, whatever returns a company is generating or whatever profits first a company is generating the debt guys have the first right over there whatever is left over should ideally come to equity but mezzanine f- uh, debt mezzanine finance given uh, the, the investors of mezzanine finance will be superior to equity shareholders but subordinate to the debt holders and it is <coughs> it'll work like this if the company performs really well then the redemption will happen in the form of debt but if the company is not performing well and there is a likelihood of a default happening then this debt will get converted into equity and if it gets converted into equity people who have invested they are technically going to have a huge loss because company is not performing well and it got converted into equity so uh, mezzanine finance has characteristics of both debt and equity so it is a hi- blend or a hybrid of long term debt it is normally high risky and that is why you will get higher return base of equity in case default default happens the debt will get converted into equity next what are the characteristics of venture capital financing this is also another way of getting money into the business venture capital will normally come for long term period liquidity may not be there they are illiquid uh, there is a high risk and a high return which will come out of the venture capital financing and these guys may take part in the equity of the company so the fund would invest over a long term horizon it can be 3 years to a maximum period of 10 years liquidity will not be there so when they want to move out of the company some other investor needs to be arranged or the company may do a buyback or the promoters may buy vc would also not hesitate to take risk and most of the times they'll do an equity participation next what are the advantages of venture capital financing so we have seen what are the characteristics what are the advantages of venture capital financing is you get long term equity finance they are more like a strategic partner so these guys like a business partner and they will share both the risk and rewards there will be a position to give lot of advice and assistant he will have a network of contacts which can help the company to perform well the venture capitalist can also bring in additional funds if required they can help in bringing an ipo and also facilitate a sale if required so capable of bringing additional rounds of funding doing an ipo or a trade sale now what is the vc investment process now vc investment process goes through a series of steps first is deal origination deal origination is finding out whether there is a need for a vc funding and this will normally happen through intermediaries once the deal originates there will be a screening done at the venture capitalist end he will do a screening and understand which companies are good to invest in then there will be a due diligence which will be done in that company just to ensure that whatever financials are given they are the right set of financials and if any kind of adjustment needs to be done if you are satisfied with these three stages a deal will get structured investments will be made post investment analysis will be done and an exit plan will be built so deal origination directly or through intermediaries once the deal is sourced the same would be sent for screening by the venture capitalist 
due diligence will be done deal structuring would be done then post investment so vc will nominate some person they will have a, co a continuous monitoring of the performance and an exit plan will be there the vc would also put a detailed exit plan the sale can be in the form of ipo or a private private sp private placement or to other vcs what are distressed securities distressed securities purchasing the securities of companies which are near bankruptcy so why do i buy these securities they will be available at a very low price and i will try to revive the securities if i am able to revive these securities what will happen is the performance of mine can improve over a longer i can generate very high returns so they will be available at a very low price is to revive the sick company once you revive the sick company and normally they do a strategy called as an arbitrage strategy you will buy debt and short shares if company performs really well uh, the share price will go up and you will have a loss here but you will get this repayment and you would have got a very high returns because the interest rate will be very high if the company performs bad then there is a loss on the debt side but there will be a profit on your short strategy so that is what we normally do in a distressed securities long position in debt and short position in equity if company's condition improves the investor will get his interest payment which will be more than the dividend on a short position if company's performance deteriorates there will be a loss on both the, the, the prices of both will come down and you will make good position now uh, on the face it's a good proposition but there are a lot of risks which are there there's a liquidity risk because you cannot sell them uh, may be saleable in the market may not be saleable in the market there can be some event risk market risk and also a human risk element will be there so this is as far as your portfolio management chapter is concerned what we learnt in a portfolio management chapter is we first understood what do you mean by portfolio management what are the objectives there are five phases of portfolio management security analysis portfolio analysis portfolio selection portfolio revision portfolio evaluation then i have a traditional approach which focuses more on the risk and the return side of it then what are the elements of risk you have a systematic risk and unsystematic risk in systematic we have interest rate risk purchasing power risk market risk unsystematic i have business risk and financial risk we saw the assumptions of markowitz and capm model advantages of a capm model is it can help in calculating risk adjusted return i can also use it for no dividend company but the beta calculation can be slightly difficult i have two types of portfolio management strategy active portfolio strategy and a passive portfolio strategy uh, for a bond selection i'll focus on yield to maturity risk to default risk of default tax yield liquidity for a selection of stock we'll focus on fundamental analysis technical analysis and random selection uh, the, we have in asset allocation strategy where we have strategic asset allocation, tactical asset allocation, insured asset allocation and integrated asset allocation. We have alternative investments wherein you can generate very high returns but they are illiquid. There is also no transparency in this. There is an extensive research which may be needed. Then we finally focused on how do you value a real estate. There are four approaches. One is your sales comparison approach, income approach, cost approach or a discounted cash flow after tax approach. Mezzanine finance is basically which is a hybrid form of financing which is a combination of debt as well as equity. Then focus was on benefits of venture capital financing characteristics and the process by which a venture capital investment will happen. And in the end we have seen something called as distressed securities. Okay, uh, let's now start with uh, chapter 6 which is on securitization. First maybe I'll explain the concept of securitization and then explain what happens in this various things. Now let's assume there is a bank or an NBFC. It will have, it would have extended auto loans, housing loans, lap loans personal loans so there are a lot of loans which it uh, has extended 
now what happens is the cash flows of the, these loans is going to come over a longer period of time the housing loans can get repaid over a period of 30 years the lap loans get get repaid over a 7 8 years the automobile loans the credit card res receivable so these different loans are going to come the repayment is going to come over a longer period of time but somewhere i want to uh, earn this money at this point of time itself so what i will do is this pool of assets will be converted and transferred to an spv spv special purpose vehicle you will transfer this pool of assets to an spv and against this uh, pool of assets you can issue new securities which are called as ptc pass through certificates either you go through a pass through certificates route which is a ptc route or i can also go through something called as a pay through securities which is pts or i can also do something called as a stripped securities these two are the predominant one pass through certificates or pay through securities these two can be issued to another investor and when I'm issuing, so what happens is I'll transfer the 500 crore of loan to the SPV. Taking this underlying asset of 500 crore, I'll tell somebody else to invest in this uh, pay through security or a pass through certificates, maybe of around 450 crores. And this 450 crores can get transferred back to the bank. So they will be in a position to convert this illiquid assets, process of con creation from the illiquid financial assets. So creation of pro additional financial product when all the assets are combined in one pool it's called bundling and when they are broken into instruments it is called as unbundling also this can become a tool of risk management in case you go for non-recourse kind of a factoring non-recourse basis of a securitization so if it's a non-recourse kind of a securitization this will also help you in protecting yourself from the risk of default uh, so this is a basic thing homogeneity is the securities are issued of homogeneous nature and even a small investors can invest now what are the benefits of securitization i can look at the benefits from an originator point of view or from an investor point of view originator is that nbfc or bank which i was telling in this example so what will happen is it will give them a way to do an off balance sheet financing so what happens is when I'm uh, doing the securitization of a loans or receivables, I transfer this money to SPV. SPV takes loans from the investor and this money gets passed on to me. So why did the money got passed on to me is because I have given them 500 crore of loans. I give 500 crore to SPV. SPV takes money from the investor. Invest uh, whatever money SPV receives it comes back to me so I can do an off balance sheet financing because this will not come as a loan in my book because I have taken this money from the SPV against whatever that 500 crore I had given also this will help me in improving my financial ratios I can focus more on my main business and also there is something called as credit enhancements which can be done on uh, your securitized transaction so your borrowing cost will also be on the lower side so reduced borrowing helps to improve financial ratios more specialization in main business from the point of view of an investor there can be a diversification of risk which can happen because the securities are backed by different types of assets also there can be some regulatory requirement that uh, uh, some companies have to invest in micro industries some companies have to invest in a particular uh, sector so all of that can be met by investing in securitized asset and if it's a recourse kind of an arrangement you are also protected against the default which can happen so there are benefits of the originator there are also benefits from the point of view of an investor as far as securitization is concerned who are the participants in a securitization transaction i have primary participants as well as i have secondary participants the primary participants are very simple there is a originator there is an spv and there is an investor so these are the three people who are their originator he is the initiator or can be called a securitizer 
he will be having all those uh, loans in his books and he is trying to securitize those loans uh, special purpose vehicle is something which has been created for the purpose of executing the deal since in SPV it all key position in the overall process of the securitization so originator gives low uh, the assets the various loans which have been extended to individuals to the SPV SPV issues PTC or PTS to the investor and gets the money and passes it back to them investors the people who invest it can be institutional investor individual provident fund insurance companies apart from that there are other parties who are also involved in the uh, there are secondary participants there's an obliger what who is an obliger is these are the parties who owe the money firm and are assets in the balance sheet of originator as an individual if i have taken the loan if i have taken the loan a housing loan or an education loan or a personal loan i will become an obliger and what will happen is i would be paying uh, i used to repay the loans so those loans which were in the books of the securitizer or the originator he has transferred to SPV there can be a rating agency the purpose of a rating agency is to rate this instruments in terms of credit quality and credit support available there's a receiving and paying agent who takes the job of collecting the money from the obligor and passing it on to SPV also if there are any defaulting borrower they would try to take actions on that there can be a credit enhancer are a trustee or a structurer uh, so what happens performance of the underlying uh, and have limited or no recourse they would want some credit enhancements to come in what is credit enhancement is in case an obligor does not fulfill his commitment of repaying the loan credit enhancer may take care of this extra point a credit enhancer may take care of the repayment of the loan so they are called as credit enhancer and there are other agents or a structural structural are basically investment bankers who will make this deal happen or who will do this now what is the mechanism of a securitization so mechanism is first creation of pool of assets these assets are held by obligors are to be repaid by the obligors then I will transfer to SPV after the transfer happens to SPV SP will do sale of either PTC or PTS or this are your <coughs> it can be mostly a PTC or a PTS this is what is normally done there's also an another phone called a stripped securities but let's focus on PTC or PTS and then RP RPA will take care of administration or uh, collection of money you may go back to the originator in case uh, recourse to the originator and finally you have repayment of funds so creation of pool of assets transferring that to SPV sale of securities through pass through certificate or pay through securities administration of assets uh, then recourse to originator in case the performance of the underlying assets are if there are default you go back to the originator SP will repay the funds in the form of interest and and credit rating to instruments what are the main problems in securitization so the main problems in securitization is basically from a stamp duty point of view what happens is there are certain states wherever there are some uh, stamp duties charged on this and that also impacts the growth of securitization industry a mortgage debt which even goes up to 12 percent and this impeded the growth some people have made this exempted and some states are trying to reduce this duty but this is one issue taxation is also another issue because there is no major uh, coverage on the taxation of securitized instruments and because of that expert opinion may sometimes get needed uh, there's no lack of, there's no standardization there's no debt market which is there for a securitized instrument so taxation accounting receivables are removed problems will arise when they are transferred back there is no standardization uh, inadequate de debt market this is more from an India's point of view the debt market is not that strong 
an ineffective foreclosure laws. Uh, what happens is foreclosure is uh, uh, the securitized instruments if there is a default by the ending borrower, if the default by the original borrower, how do you take care of that? So are not supportive to lending institution and this makes securitized instruments especially less attractive because lenders find it difficult in transfer of property in the event of default by the borrower. So <coughs> just to explain again in detail, there is a bank or an NBFC loans to individuals, bank or an NBFC's originator individuals are obligors they transfer this to SPV SPV issues PTC or PTS to investors so so once <coughs> once this PTC or PTS is issued to investors the SPV will get the money on day one and that is transferred back to the bank. So in the bank, this loans will be removed from the balance sheet and against that they would have received some money. In the event of a default happens, this whatever loans got transferred to the SPV will get transferred back to the bank if it's a with recourse kind of an arrangement. Now let's now focus on this PTC and PTS pass through certificates and pay through securities what is pass through certificate is this whenever you go through a PTC route uh, you transfer the entire receipt of cash in the form of interest or principal from the asset zone that will mean there is a direct claim of the investor so the difference is PTC and PTS the main difference is on day 90 I had to earn the interest in a PTC kind of a mode, day 90 I have to pay the interest to the uh, investors. In a PTC kind of a mode, uh, if I receive the interest earlier from my obligors, if I receive it in day 60, then the day 60 interest is passed back to the investor. So you had to pay interest only on day 90, but because obligors have done a prepayment, you will also do a prepayment to the PTC investors. In a PTS kind of an arrangement, if there is a prepayment on day 60, instead of doing a prepayment, the SPV will invest this money for a period of 30 days and then pay the interest to the investors. So, since all cash flows, the investors carry a proportional beneficial interest. So, what happens is if there is a prepayment payment of principal that is also proportionately distributed whereas in a pay through certificate it is backed by this assets there is a backing of the assets but the cash flows is not directly linked so if there is a prepayment if there is a <coughs> all cash flows in case of early retirement of receivables can be used for short term yield so this also provides you the opportunity to issue several debt transfer PTC and PTS. The main difference is if there is a prepayment of debt by the obligors, that money will be automatically transferred to PTC investors, but that will not be transferred to PTS investors. It will be invested for a 30 day period and thereafter the money will get transferred back to the PTS investor. So PTC investors will, if there's a delay in payment, then PTC investors will get the money later because there has been delay in payment by my obligors. In case of a PTS, if there are any credit enhancements in place, those credit enhancements can uh, come into picture and the PTS investors. So PTS will get steady state money at the end of every three months. PTC investors at the end of second month can get a huge amount. Then they may get some money at the end of fourth month, some money at the end of six months. So there can be a skewness in their cash flow. The principles are repaid before the schedule time. And stripped securities are those securities where either you earn only on the interest side or only on the principal side. So interest only securities will reserve interest while principal money, principal only securities will reserve uh, only principal. This is highly volatile and it is less preferred by the investors, not normally which is preferred in the market 
how is the next is how is the pricing of the securitized instruments done what is pricing of the securitized instrument is the rate of interest on the ptc or pts now uh, what will you do is you are going to try to uh, ensure that what should be the rate of interest which is to be paid by the in which is to be paid to the investor so originator would like to price it at a rate which is uh, from an originator point of view he would like to price it at a rate which is on the lower side investors would like to price it at a rate which is on the higher side so what they will normally do is they will do a comparison with a comparable security and based on a comparable security you will get a yield do some adjustment and accordingly fix the rate of interest so originator can price uh, at a rate at which originator has to incur an outflow and if that outflow can be amortized through securitization process from an investor point of view he would like to determine the discounting best estimate of the future cash flow using rate of yield of a comparable security you go through a comparable security route so securitization is a very simple concept there's a person called as an originator he will transfer this housing loans education loans or personal loans to a party called as spv spv will issue ptc or pts to the investor and in this process originator will get the money on day one instead of waiting for few years to collect the money from the obligors and in case an obligor defaults on the payment if it's a recourse kind of an arrangement the loss will have to be borne by the originator if it's a non-recourse kind of an arrangement the loss will have to be borne by the spv which indirectly means the investor is going to bear the loss so there are benefits from the point of originator from the points of investor there are primary participants and secondary participants primary is originator special purpose vehicle and investor your secondary is obligors these are the people who are the main reason why this <coughs> happens and you also have rating agency receiving and paying agent structurer credit and answer agency or trustee so this is what uh, securitization is all about a very simple area and normally one theory question is expected from this topic <coughs> okay uh, let's now move to the next topic next chapter which is on mutual funds chapter 7 i think i had covered this in detail in the class this is as to why mutual fund comes into picture mutual fund is purpose of a mutual fund is to pool money of various small investors who cannot directly invest in stock markets or capital markets because they may not have knowledge in investing in stock markets so mutual funds are basically a professional money managing institutions which will pool money from lot of small investors and they will invest their money in various instruments according to whatever the scheme objective says there will be a scheme objective which will indicate where the money is going to be invested so investors will give the money to the mutual fund they will invest this money in various debt securities or equity securities and pass back the returns to the investor so that's how a mutual fund works there are various classification of a mutual fund there can be a functional classification which indicates it can be an open-ended fund or a close-ended fund there can be a classification based on the portfolio it can be an equity funds it can be a debt fund it can be a special fund there can be classification on the basis of ownership so i have a functional classification i have a portfolio classification i have a classification based on ownership now first let's focus on functional classification which is an open-ended fund and a close-ended fund in an open-ended fund a mf investor can buy units or redeem units at any point of time can make entry and exit at any time in a close ended funds what will happen is the investor can buy into the security only during the initial offering or the new fund offering and if at all you want to exit then you will have to sell it through stock markets they would have got listed and you will have to do it through stock markets they have a limited life and at the end the corpus will get liquidated so i have an open ended fund and a close ended fund 
my classification can also happen based on portfolio wherein I have equity funds equity funds are basically those securities which are going to invest in uh, equity shares or uh, stock markets uh, you can have a growth fund these are going to focus on earning long-term capital appreciation to the investors then I have something called as an aggressive funds they normally try to invest in securities which are likely to give super normal returns they may invest in speculative shares income funds income funds are those which makes their investments in securities which pay regular dividends so with the regular dividends I will try to earn the dividends and pass it on to the end investor and a balance funds which tries to balance the growth and the income side debt funds debt funds can be categorized as bond funds and guilt funds bond funds are basically they invest in fixed income securities this invest only in government security here you can make investments on corporate debentures convertible debentures money markets government bonds uh, fixed deposits you can invest in various securities but guilt funds are those which are investing only in government security we also have special funds there are a lot of special funds index funds are those which will invest in various indices which are there in India point of view it can invest in nifty or it can invest in sensex international funds is that raises money in India but invests globally offshore fund is it raises money globally but invests in India you also have sector funds which is going to make investments in a particular industry money market funds which is going to make investments in uh, basically uh, short term interest securities whose main objective is to preserve capital and ease liquidity fund of funds is going to invest money in other mutual funds you have capital protection oriented fund uh, there is a base amount which will be invested this is your constant proportion portfolio insurance CPPI strategy will come here so <coughs> base amount will be invested in risk free securities and any amount above that will be invested in risky securities gold funds are those which will invest only in gold I can also do on the basis of ownership there can be public sector mutual fund private sector mutual fund or foreign mutual funds so there is this is what is the different types of funds which we are seeing uh, there can be functional classification which is an open-ended fund and a close-ended fund uh, portfolio classification can be equity fund debt fund and special fund in equity we have growth aggressive income and balanced that said we have bond and guilt in special funds we had index funds international funds offshore funds sector funds money sec money market funds capital protection funds fund of funds now what are the various types of schemes which are there in mutual fund schemes <coughs> so you can have one thing called as a balanced scheme which will have both debt and equity in their investment there can be equity diversified fund which is going to invest only in equity shares you can have a flexi cap or a multi cap fund contra fund index fund you also have ELSS funds these are the funds where you get ATC exemptions sector funds it's pretty much similar but all these are kind of breakup of your equity oriented funds which are there arbitrage funds hedge funds cash fund all of this has its own set of purposes and they'll make investments based on those purposes now next is what are the advantages and limitations of mutual fund advantages is very simple I get access to professional management these people <coughs> know about finance industry they have an idea as to how stock markets work they have an idea as to how the economy is going to work so I will be in a position to invest in <coughs> various securities with the help of professional management I can invest in a diversified set of security normally mutual funds give better returns than other uh, forms of investment there is also a transparency liquidity is there professional diversification uh, higher returns low cost liquidity transparency convenient administration all these are kind of benefits which are there when you invest in mutual funds also they are highly regulated so because they are highly regulated they have to comply and there is less possibility of a cheating or anything and economies of scale because they pull money from so many people they can uh, their cost of investing or the expense ratio will be lower than the expense ratio of the other set of the people there are certain drawbacks which are there in mutual fund the drawbacks is there is no guarantee of return 
this is the most important factor uh, all mutual funds cannot be winners mutual funds may perform better than the stock market but this does not mean it will always be a gain and investors may forgive if the return is not adequate but they will not do so if the principle is eroded so sometimes even the principle can get eroded so mutual funds all mutual funds are not going to be winners mutual funds may perform better than the stock market but this does not mean there is going to be a gain diversification is good because it minimizes risk but it will not help in maximizing the returns also it can become difficult for people to select a proper fund also there are cost factors unethical practices in fact taxation issues have also started coming in uh, so there is capital gain taxation which can be there for the mutual fund and now the individual investors are also required to pay tax with the change in the taxation structure so there are a lot of benefits of mutual fund there are some drawbacks the major drawback is no guarantee of return diversification will not help in maximizing the returns selecting a proper fund can be an issue there are cost related issues there can be unethical practices so mutual fund is a very simple chapter you have different types of funds which are there you first learn what is a mutual fund what are the different types of funds and schemes which are there and advantages and limitations of a mutual fund